I'll declare the 16th of February meeting of the Transport and Infrastructure Committee open. Uh, before I proceed to the apologies, I just want to take this opportunity to extend the sincere sympathies of the Auckland Council to the family of Dave Van Swanenberg. Uh, Dave, of course, was the volunteer firefighter who lost his life uh, in the Murawai landslide earlier in the week. Dave was amongst those uh, brave firefighters investigating a flooded house when the landslide crashed down, uh, badly injuring one of his colleagues. So at uh, this moment, um, our thoughts are very much with the Van Swanenberg family, uh, as indeed with um, other affected people right across New Zealand. This uh, meeting <laughs> wasn't exactly even certain it would be taking part <laughs> earlier in the week. It is, and we're grateful for that. Um, a consequence of that, however, is that we do still have a, a number of uh, councillors who are out in the community doing various uh, activities around their own wards. Um, so the apologies which we'll go to now is quite an extended list, and, and it has been up since. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, given those factors, we'll, we'll just go to a, a quick roll call just to establish um, who is here and, and who is online. Okay, uh, Councillor Baker. Oh, very lonely over this side. Um, Good. Councillor Bartley. IMSB member James Brown. Councillor Dalton, Councillor Darby, Councillor Darby, Councillor Filipina, Councillor Chris Fletcher, present online, Councillor Fully, present online, IMSB member Tao Hinari. Oh, Kira John, it's David Taibari here. It's actually me that's on the committee today instead of uh, Honey Renata. Okay, Th thank you, David. Councillor Henderson. Councillor Hills. Councillor Mike Lee. Present. Councillor Leone. Online, present. Councillor Newman. IMSB member Renata. Uh, she's a, yes. Oh, Thank you, John. Yes. Online. Thank you. Thank you, John. Deputy Mayor Simpson. Morning, Chair. I'm online. Councillor Stewart. Morning. Councillor Turner. Online. Present. Councillor Walker. Uh, Councillor Williamson. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair. And so, sorry, Councillor Ferry, who somehow was missed off that list. I, oh, okay. I can see that you're here. So, so I'll, I will now run through some of the apologies for lateness. Uh, so we have apologies for that, uh, respect of Councillor Hills, Dalton, Bartley, and Mayor Brown, all on council business. Um, there is no apologies for early departure at this stage. So we have Ken Turner on screen. And we, we have Ken Turner, yes, we've, we've noted that. Okay, um, I'll move that the um, apologies be accepted. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Walker, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Uh, item two, declarations of interest. Uh, none have been received. Are there any declarations of interest as to the meeting today? No. Um, confirmation of minutes. We have the minutes of the 1st of December 2022, open and confidential minutes. Um, I'll, put, uh, I'll move that those minutes be accepted, seconded by uh, Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Mm -hmm. We have received no petitions. 
Um, we move to the, the first substantive part of the meeting today, and that's uh, with respect of uh, public input. We have had uh, four requests received, um, all accepted. Um, we have um, made it clear to our presenters that in public input uh, we, we try very hard to keep to the, the five minute limit. Some of these presentations today are to do with fairly substantive matters, but um, we'll, we'll request that the presenters please uh, endeavour to do all they can to keep around that five minute mark and, and to allow a little bit of time for questions. So our first presenter today, and I think that presentation will have been emailed through to members. It's on Nexus. It's on Nexus. Is Anna Thorburn from the Gulf Harbour um, Ferry Group. And Anna will address the committee um, on behalf of that ferry users group regarding the Gulf Harbour Ferry Service. Thank you, Anna, for coming along today. And the floor is now yours. Sorry, can you please use the microphone in front of you? Thank you. Start again. Kia ora tato, ko mangafo te maonga. Ko muriwai te awa, no tamaki aho. Ko Thorburn Tokufanu, ko Anna Tokoingawa. Firstly, I'd like to thank Mayor Brown, Councillor John Watson, and fellow councillors for allowing us to speak here today. I wish to acknowledge that Tamaki Makoto, our Auckland, is hurting. Our Maunga, our Awa and our Moana have seen significant devastation across the region and nationally beyond. Your leadership and tireless efforts to see restoration of access to Tamaki Makoto, her infrastructure strengthened and ultimately keeping Auckland moving has proven resilience and leadership and for this we are grateful. Thank you and nā mihi. I'm here to represent over 5,000 people in our community and over 1,000 passengers who have come together to raise concern around the consistent, persistent failure and loss of confidence in Fullers as a provider of the Gulf Harbour Ferry Service. We seek permanence of commuter public transport by ferry from Gulf Harbour. It has been in place for 26 years and in the last two years we have seen that service diminish significantly. We want to understand what levers there are within the current contract to improve the service and want to understand why there's only six years contract signed and not 12. We are seeking assurances that we will see an improvement in the service. Our passengers have experienced many impacts following the pandemic response and regional weather and national weather issues over the last two years. We have seen a consistent failure by Fullers to provide a full service. In October last year, we met as a community group with Fullers and AT and reported a passenger failure rate of services scheduled at 34%. Now in February, that has risen to 37% of all scheduled ferry trips are no longer by ferry. What we experience is not world-class public transport as proclaimed by Fullers. We want a ferry service, it is what we pay for. Our infrastructure can currently not support the number of vehicles that are commuting one and a half to three hours a day in both directions from Rodney District to the city centre. Waka Otahi needs to restore our roads and we need Auckland Transport to impress on Fullers to keep our waka floating. Over the next couple of slides, you will see personal experiences from our commuters. I'm not going to go through these one by one. What I ask of you is to join our Gulf Harbour Ferry user group and see the day in, day out experiences of commuters being left behind. People who are not physically mobile or capable of morphing from Pier 8 Ferry Terminal to the bottom of Custom Street in a matter of minutes to catch an alternative bus that drives away because they're not there within that selected time frame. We have the opportunity to save 3.3 million tonne a year on carbon emissions by putting the boats back in the water and getting cars and buses off the road for that route. We simply want the ferry service because that is what we pay for. We don't trust the data that you will receive as passenger numbers are dwindling and we hold Fullers personally accountable for that. 
The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. The communications are appalling and we have found as a community that we rely on each other to collate all of the alert data and bring it together to make sense of the multiple platforms that we look at. What you see here is what we are asked to go to. Sorry, I can see a hand raised. Um, where we actually look is across nine different platforms and it's clear to us that there is a lack of communication between Fullers, Auckland Transport and Ports of Auckland, particularly off the back of last week's incident when we had a ship coming in to be refuelled right on peak very new time. In page 18 and 19 of your agenda, there is a quote by Auckland Transport that there is a 97% reliability rate. We can test that because our data that we capture on a day-to-day -day basis shows that 37% of all ferry crossings are cancelled or replaced by bus from the 1st of January 2022 to the 10th of February this year. On the next slide, you'll see in the shadowed area the number of possible ferry trips per month. The green bars show you which ferry trips are operated by bus or alternative transport. The small blue line at the bottom is what we would be willing to accept as a failure rate because of the 18% impact of weather that results in cancellations to our service. 78% of cancellations are operational constraints and that's been the excuse from Fullers for quite some time. What we would like to see next from councillors is perhaps consideration for focusing on providing commuter services on the peak times where we need them most. We're willing to let go of daytime services that don't have the passenger intake or the revenue that you'd desire. We want to see full reporting on recruitment and contracted routes. We want to understand the pain that fullers experience in terms of penalties when they don't provide a boat to service our community. Thank you for your time. Now, mihi most to our skippers and crew who consistently turn up on a day-to-day -day basis to serve us well. Thank you very much for your presentation, Anna. Uh, we have a time for a few uh, succinct questions. Councillor Walker. Sure. So I, I certainly follow the, uh, the Facebook page. I'm a, I'm a member. One of the suggestions that you put is having the ferry dock at Gulf yes. Harbour. So it's there, so it can kick off a, a morning uh, run. Why can't that happen? So during the COVID lockdown in 2020, Fuller's relocated the, the entire Gulf Harbour fleet of three ferries to the downtown area. The reason being for operational reasons, it allows them to redeploy crew and service the inner routes. What we see now, and it's not just our service that is impacted, Waiheke, which is obviously the priority service user, being isolated. They're also having a lot of their ferries cancelled and rerouted. Since the Devonport frequency was increased, as well as the summer runs increasing, we just don't have the Fullers just don't have the crew to support that. We, we have asked why that is, and it's clearly evident to us that people leave managers, not jobs. Councillor Chris Fletcher online. Thank, thank you, Anna, um, and thank you for your presentation. I would like you to just outline, um, and I understand you're a health professional, but what the impact in a health sense has been on this unreliability in a, and, and perhaps on you personally? Um, I can speak for a lot of people on this. There's a lot of anxiety and stress and vote. And I can give an example of last evening at 9 p.m. I was prepared with my ferry tag for AT, all of my things to come down by ferry today. At 10 past 10, an alert came in from Fullers to say that the morning services were cancelled and there was no suggestion of alternative transport and the poor English in it suggested that we would catch the bus from H&M stop. This morning at quarter to six, I left in my car to drive down I was going to stop at Silverdale Station to catch the bus, but buses were cancelled there also. An alert came in at 6.15 to say that there was alternative bus transport at the ferry terminal for 6.30. In the past, I have been stranded in town and as a result, despite asking Fullers for assistance to get home, ended up catching an Uber myself because my toddler was left stranded at daycare and if I didn't get the Uber, I wouldn't have got to him. So... 
that's one mother. There's many mothers, there's many employees of organisations that have been challenged by their employers because they're getting late to work because of the unreliability of the service. And what that does is it pushes us out of public transport and we just don't trust AT. Okay, thank you. They've become uh, the apologist. Just thank you, Anna. Councillor Lee and Councillor Ferry. Thank you. Um, and good morning, Anna, and thank you for that presentation. Um, as a Ferry user myself since the 1970s, I'm interested to know whether you have noticed um, a deterioration um, in recent years, um, and when do you think that started to happen? I'm a Mangafau girl by life. I've lived in Mount Eden most of my life, and I moved to the coast in 2013 and have lived between the two. Since moving permanently there in 2019, the service has deteriorated significantly in the last two years. It worsened the first peak after COVID when the boats were relocated to downtown. Since December, we've seen, sorry, May 2022, we saw a quarter of all services replaced by bus. Since December, we're now seeing over half of the services scheduled replaced by bus. It, it, it is measurable then, isn't it? I, I, I must say I've noticed that um, as well. Um, and I'd have to say, you asked me five years ago, I would have said that Fuller's Ferry Services were one of the best performing PT modes that we had, but I can't say that now. Can I just say that in regard to... Um, the berthing of cruise ships, I have, um, I'm aware of that problem and I have approached the CE of the Ports of Auckland and I've also taken it up with the acting CEO of, of um, Auckland Transport because the Harbour Master reports to Auckland Transport as part of the Auckland Transport Empire and um, with the request that the Harbour Master talks to the port about a more rational rational um, approach to berthing cruise ships. In other words, we have a premier cruise ship uh, terminal at Queen's Wharf, yes, not sir. in the ferry basin. Okay. Th thank you, Councillor Lee. I, th I think that's relevant, but I think we'll, we'll save that. There is going to be an item on the ferries later on. Councillor Ferry. Thank you. Um, just a really quick question. Reading your presentation, uh, you mentioned some of the issues around mobility, and I know one of the problems we've had over this side with... Um, replacing trains with buses at the last minute, is there are people who, who simply, who would use a train but can't use a bus. So for example, they're mm. on a bicycle or they've got a mobility device that doesn't fit on a bus. Is that an issue with these ferry cancellations as well? It is an issue, but I don't believe that it's overly well reported to followers to manage. Okay, One of the other issues is the fact you can't get your e-bike on a bus. So those of us that wanted to bike to the ferry and then bike to our jobs, we can't do that. Okay, thank, thank you, Anna, for your presentation. Um, Councillor Walker will uh, move to receive the public input from Anna, and thank you for attending. Councillor Lee will, will, will second that. Uh, Anna, by way of uh, feedback, uh, the material that you have presented to us today will be of use later on in the meeting, and uh, uh, as part of uh, resolutions, I suspect that will emerge from that, uh, because uh, you've touched on the main points, but there is indeed a lot more that could be said about this service and ferry services generally. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Opposed? Carried. Our next presenter is Will McKenzie and Arvind Daji, uh, who will be talking to the Auckland Transport Plan. So I'll call Will and Arvind to the table now. And their presentation is also on next if, if you need to speak, just press the, uh, the little button there that's got talk beside it. I think it's on your right-hand side. Could you just let us have the extra printouts when they're done, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> please follow our slides on the big screen. These options for your consideration have been assessed as required by the Resource Management Act. Uh, option selection is a field which I studied 
uh, called Operations Research. Option one, the 1946 plan for Auckland provided for rail rapid transit, road building and the development of Auckland. The 1976 plan married the, mirrored the 46 and earlier plans. The 2012 to 2042 plan is for a comprehensive, strategic, long-term, high-quality, joined-up, integrated transport network for Auckland by 2042 that minimises emissions. An outline plan was subsequently adopted, however, the 2042 plan still has legal weight. The 2042 plan provides for rail rapid transit from Avondale to airport, which could be built for use by rolling stock of the current design for three to six billion. Alternatively, the sector could be built for heavy rail metro rolling stock, as used in many cities, for two to four billion. Metro rolling stock is capable of navigating sharp corners and climbing and descending steep inclines. Options 1A and 1B were not properly assessed by Auckland Light Rail, including by not determining an indicative cost. Option 2. The 2042 plan provides for bus rapid transit on routes including the Northern Busway. A bus-only road can only carry around 70,000 passengers per day. However, a high-capacity BRT can carry 700,000 passengers, more than any light rail line. This is BRT in Lima, Peru, that carries 700,000 passengers per day. This is BRT in Jakarta, they carry over a million per day. Electric buses can be powered by next generation overhead wire technology. The Northwestern motorway is already wide enough to accommodate central running BRT. BRT on the Northwestern motorway can be linked to the Northern Busway via Spaghetti Junction with central city stations allowing for buses to through run the central city. Building options one and two would complete Auckland's high quality joined up transit network by 2030. To our knowledge, BRT has not been considered for any busway in Auckland. Option three, active transport. Like the bridges shown, um, the clip-ons bottom right are also wide enough for three lanes, but only carry two. Um, these bridges accommodate two lanes and active transport. At bottom right, Active transport and wide lanes can be accommodated on each clip-on. Protected 2.4 metre active transport paths can be created by moving the existing vehicle barriers inwards 2.1 metres. This is a photo of the clip-ons under construction with the alignment of a relocated steel barrier. A Waka Katahi Commission report found that this option can provide safe walking and cycling without reducing the number of lanes, but also found that the steel deck prevents fixation of a barrier on the deck. UC Professor of Engineering has given a preliminary view that he can't see why it is not possible to secure a steel barrier to the clip-on decks. Installing active transport paths would allow the pyrolyurethane coating on the paths to be reduced in thickness, reducing the weight of each clip-on by at least 50 tonnes. WK has stated that it would not provide active, will not provide active transport on the bridge, but has not provided the evidence that it supports its decision. Option four, <coughs> the central lanes and the clip-ons cannot accommodate the heaviest trucks on New Zealand's roads. The current crossing is a significant missing link in the Upper North Island's freight network. Over time, steel bridges can require expansion and or rehabilitation. Some examples, the Huey Pilong the Long Bridge near New Orleans was widened on its existing piers in 2013. A common technique is to build a replica bridge next to an original so as not to detract from built heritage. Frequently, a bridge is built with as many lanes as needed and when, as expected, more lanes are need later needed and adjacent identical bridges built. This technique was used at historic Natchez on the Mississippi River and at Tampa Bay, Florida and in downtown New Orleans. Another technique is to build the adjacent replica bridge on temporary piers. This allows the bridge to be replaced on the existing piers, which is extremely cost effective. <coughs> at bottom right, the Milton Madison Bridge was replaced in 2014 at a cost of only $104 million US. Murray Johnson is the world's leading exponent of this and similar bridge building techniques and works for Stantec, which has an office in Newmarket. The technique could be used to build a new Auckland Harbour Bridge to the east of the existing bridge on temporary piers. The replica bridge would then be slid 40 metres west onto the refurbished piers, allowing multiple modes to cross the harbour safely. 
The replacement would take around five years, cost on the order of $2 billion. The new bridge would be wider, but otherwise near identical to the bridge as built in 1959. AU Associate Professor Clifton is of the opinion that the bridge replacement proposal is feasible. Waka Katahi have been asked if option four will be assessed, including for cost and climate impact. An answer has not been received. Thank you. We are happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Will, for that uh, very interesting presentation there. Uh, opportunity for questions. Councillor Walker. Sure. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. In respect of the the quick fixes that you indicate, um, you know, 1A, 1B and, and 2, um, given, as you point out, that these are very affordable, mm -hmm. there's a huge difference between the, uh, the cost of these, for example, and the conceivably 30 billion light rail um, alone. What's the, um, what's the implementation time around getting some of this um, up, and, um, up and running? And has there been any preliminary work done in that respect? Um, Thank you. Um, the rail corridor has been there to only hunger for around 50 years. So the work to extend it, particularly to Three Kings, could be started immediately. You could start clearing the land before you even got resource consent. And Kiwi Rail's been building railway tracks for 125 years, so I think they could get on and do it pretty quickly. And just to further supplementary, it would be fair to say that that would build on the significant investment that we've already incurred in the CRL. In, is that correct? Indeed. If you see the 2042 plan, that includes the CRL, and that plan is before the CRL was improved. The CRL was approved with this extension to Anihanga and the airport in mind. It's what makes the CRL worth the money. Okay. Th thank you for that uh, answer, Will. So uh, two questions, one by uh, Councillor Darby online and then Councillor Ferry. Thanks, Chair. Um, kia ora, Will. Um, well, look, you've, you've previously been before us, you've been advocating for uh, trackless trams. You're not advocating for that as you um, did so fervently then. Uh, today no, you're advocating... Councillor today Daly, I did not, did not advocate trackless trams. Um, okay, well, look, maybe it wasn't um, formally, but I do recall you talking to me about that. Um, I'm, look, I'm sorry, today... Sorry, I've never advocated trackless trams so, in, so, in any way. Okay. So, okay. so, so, so today, yeah. So I, I, I want to get a sense of how, um, a say option one a, um, how does it connect and integrate it, integrate with the city rail link, with the additional Watamata Harbour connection, where that the, the uh, work that we're starting to see calls for rapid transit priority. Uh, we need rapid transit priority going northwest to reinforce bus connections and rail that's already there. So how does this integrate? That's my first question. Um, my second question is, I'm assuming you've read the Auckland Light Rail IBC, you know, the Indicative Business Case. You mention a range of figures here mm -hmm. um, of, of um, for... for um, um, going from light rail to tunnel light rail to light metro of, of uh, nine, and then you've got a range that doubles that, doubles it for uh, the um, tunnel light rail and doubles it for light metro. Can you just tell me, in the, my first question, Chair, then I'll have another, is just explain the integration and explain where you got that top of the range number from, which does not appear in the IBC. Thank you. Um, the integration happens as per the um, Auckland Strategic Transport Network Plan 2042. That shows rail rapid transit going into the CRL to the airport. It shows bus rapid transit going across the harbour. And as elsewhere in the presentation, bus rapid transit can have a higher capacity than light rail. So we, we see um, bus rapid transit and rail rapid transit providing integrated uh, transit right across Auckland. Uh, and the second question, 
the figures of uh, $9 billion, or uh, the, the, the first figure that we've given for the cost is the figure from the IBC. The second figure is, is double that, which was given by New Zealand Treasury, who I'm not in the habit of arguing with. Um, thank you. Okay, Councillor Fury. Thank you. Just Sorry, Chair, I've got a second question there. Um, my, no, my second... No, just, no. So you've had to, Councillor the Derby. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Fiery. We've, we've got quite a bit to, to get through here, if you don't mind. My question's very short, so, yeah. so you might have time to come back to him. Um, so I'm just really interested in regard to the RBT staff. We just heard from um, someone in regard to the, the difference between catching a ferry and catching a bus for those who are, for example, using a bicycle. Sure. How have other cities um, dealt with that issue um, with their RBT networks? If they have. Uh, rapid bus transit. Um, uh, from what I've seen, rapid bus around the world, like most rapid rail, doesn't include people carrying bikes. But in Auckland, with our lower loads, if you can see from the pictures of the bus in Jakarta, there's a lot more room in the bus. So you'd have much more chance of carrying bikes. And the internal cab space would be very similar to a train. So I think you'd have more chance to carry the bike separately outside the vehicle or on a trailer is a little bit messy if you've got high capacity um, um, transit of any kind. But certainly with the, with the more space inside the bus, the level boarding, so you can roll your bike straight on. So certainly for bicycles and for people with particularly with mobility, with, uh, with um, wheelchairs, it's really important that they can have level boarding and this brings it to buses, which we think is a great thing. Thank you, Councillor Fury. You will see... Uh motion on the screen to uh, receive the input from Will McKenzie and Arvind Daji and thank them for attending. I'm very happy to move that. Seconded by Councillor Walker. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Uh, against? Carried. And thank you both gentlemen for that uh, very comprehensive presentation and that material uh, will be retained and no doubt uh, can be pressed onto the, the Mayor as he continues his journey through his transport plan with the with the Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Councillors and Mr Mayor, who I've just sent around. Thank you. Thank you. OK, the next uh, presenter today is uh, Jeff Upsom, um, and, and Jeff is presenting in uh, uh, his personal capacity as a local board member here, not on behalf of the local board, but as a board member who's taken an interest in the recent changes to the transport network, uh, particularly as they go to the installation of, of speed tables and speed bumps and the impact that they are going to that they are having on um, the transport network welcome Jeff and uh, you've got five minutes away you go is that on yeah, perfect um, yeah obviously speed bumps is probably the most serious issue which I'm personally seeing out there on the road um, I just wanted to remind everyone I am here on my personal capacity and not representing the Botany Local Board, which I am an elected member of. Um, I'm only one of nine there, and, and, and therefore my views today uh, are my own, and, and also the views of the community who voted for me, uh, but not the local board. Uh, I just wanted to point out, in 2021, uh, in all of New Zealand, we had zero fatal crashes on pedestrian crossings. Zero fatal crashes on pedestrian crossings. And so building pedestrian crossings into raised speed table pedestrian crossings is not going to save any lives because it didn't cost any lives when they were flat, before they were raised. There were no lives lost. Um, yes, we have had some in other years, um, but if we look at 2021 with zero fatals on, on any pedestrian crossings in all of the country, uh, that's certainly not good statistics when we're spending $260,000 per raised pedestrian speed table. It is absolutely ludicrous that uh, any government department has, has taken money away from road maintenance and other important infrastructure maintenance and upgrades to build something the community does not want. Uh, I'm a tradesman, and that's my main uh, source of income as a tradesman. Uh, everyone else that's in the trades, you know, we have trade vehicles, we need to travel around, uh, and putting these speed bumps on main arterial routes and state highways, in, in our opinion, in, in the opinion of the people I represent, is, is inappropriate, and it doesn't add any benefit to anybody. Uh, like I said, in 2021, there were zero fatal crashes on pedestrian crossings in all of the country, raised or not raised. Um, Speed bumps, block drains, uh, cycle lanes, uh, some of you will be aware, Upper Harbour Drive in Greenhithe has had, uh, this is as of January, 
the spending has gone up. But as of January, the spending on Upper Harbour Drive to build a separated cycle lane, uh, there was no injuries before it was separated with these big concrete blocks. The spending to put those concrete blocks in was $2 million. $117,163. So over $2 million to put in some cycle lane uh, concrete blocks that nobody wanted. People have been injured. Cyclists have been injured. Um, and cars have been written off after uh, impacting with these concrete blocks. And there were no injuries before these concrete blocks were put in. Um, potholes, on the, uh, potholes on the sealed and unsealed road network could be repaired for a fraction of the amount of money spent on speed tables. Uh, another idea I have is spending the climate action targeted rate, or the Qatar, on some of the overdue drain uh, maintenance on our road network. Um, the speed limits, back in 2019, we all found out the speed limits were being reduced, uh, much to our horror and disgust as a road user. Um, you, you know, we, we had, uh, it was advertised that $700 million was allocated to the speed management program, uh, $700 million, which could have potentially been used to fix some potholes. Um, I'm not sure quite where that program is. I've tried to search for that uh, recently, and, and that sort of seems to have disappeared. So I'm not sure how much of that $700 million was spent, uh, or, or you know, maybe the whole lot was spent and it's run out, and now we've moved on to something else. Um, yeah, again, that's uh, that's pretty much it, really. So just like I said, you know, I'm going to represent the people who use the roads. Uh, we're very, very upset with some of the um, changes that have been happening to our road network, especially from the point of view as tradespeople, uh, freight operators, emergency services, um, and, and in a sense, anybody who has no option but to drive. Uh, I know there's going to be some benefits to cyclists and public transport users, but like myself, uh, it's not viable um, for me to carry a sheet of jib onto a bus. It's just, it's just not practical. Um, and hopefully I've got some questions to be answered, but uh, again, like I said, no more speed bumps, please. Okay, Jeff, thanks uh, for your presentation. We do indeed have uh, some questions. First question from Councillor Henderson. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, so in terms of demand for speed tables, uh, in most cases it actually comes from the local schools uh, and local residents where they want children to be safely walking and cycling to their school uh, neighbourhood. So what would you say to those schools that do lobby us to put speed tables in? Now, are we talking about schools on the state highway or are we talking about schools that are in a little subdivision? I mean, just a, just a bit of clarification would be great. Thank you. I think my question was perfectly clear. Um, yeah, I'll repeat it if you like. Uh, so primary schools and high schools as well lobby us all the time to put speed tables around their school neighbourhoods so that their students can walk and cycle to school. I, I think that's an, a very clear question. Uh, what would you say to those schools uh, when they do lobby us for those things? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two answers. OK, so, so first of all, if we've got a school in a small division that is not on a main road or not on a state highway. Well, absolutely, that's that's up to that community that's affected by that. Um, and I'm not going to get in the way of a genuine uh, request from the majority of the public. Um, but for example, where I live in Kaukopakopa, on State Highway 16, now State Highway 16, for those of you who don't know, runs from the ports of Auckland up to Wellsford. Uh, part of it is a motorway uh, and part of it is a single lane each direction. Now, Kaukopakopa is an important part of that State Highway network. Uh, and at the moment, uh, there is a proposal to build uh, three. Uh, depending on who you talk to, there's potentially going to be five uh, raised pedestrian speed tables in Kaukopakopa on State Highway 16. Now, in my opinion, and obviously the opinion of everyone who voted for me and supports what I'm doing here today, uh, that is inappropriate. We don't want the speed bumps on the State Highway Network or important uh, transport routes. So what I would say to those schools is, Again, 2021, zero fatals on the pedestrian crossings at all, whether they were raised or not raised. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, two Thanks, final Jim. questions, one from Councillor Newman and one from Councillor Sayers. Good morning, Jeff. Um, so you and I are not going to run every aspect of the issue around traffic calming this summer. I think it's appropriate, some which are not, and certainly to put raised pedestrian crossings um, on regional arterials like the Great South Road, that, that's a real push for me because um, there are the reasons why they're regional arterials. But what I'm curious to know actually, just reflecting on 
the recent storm events and since you're here is your reflections about the state of the of the substructure of of, of the roading network in in the northwest because you've taken a lot of rain up there but prior to that there seemed to be some quite significant anecdotal evidence um, of the sealed road network in the northwest really struggling already because of water inundation and and causing what it appeared to be more than just little potholes. Some of these were quite cratered, um, and there's patch ups and fixes going on all over the place. Have you got any any sense of um, um, scalability of the work to roll out through that area to do that remedial um, repairs um, pending road reconstruction in the northwest? Most of what I've seen as far as flood damage uh, is, is to do with block drains. Um, and so I know our mayor's talked about this quite a lot. And if, if there's a block drain near your home, uh, get out there before the storm and check it's cleared. Um, I've shared this on my social media as well. You know, while, while it is the Auckland Transport's responsibility to make sure the drains are cleared and, and functioning, um, Auckland Transport doesn't have the capacity to go and inspect uh, every uh, drain um, and culvert. They, Auckland Transport relies on uh, complaints and reports from the public um, and, and if it's easy enough to just sort it out with a spade in two minutes, you know, people could just do it themselves and, and save their homes and the roads that they rely on. Um, as far as scaling the work that needs to be done, it's, it's, not, it's not an issue of clearing flood damage, it's an issue of catching up on the overdue road maintenance, drainage clearing, vegetation clearing. Um, all of those things need to be taken care of and the storm damage, while it's significant, the storm damage is not that much in comparison to the overdue maintenance which, which Auckland Transport is behind on. Final question, Councillor Sayers. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's pro probably segues in from um, Councillor Newman's question. Uh, just through you, John, uh, just th thank you, Jeff. For your presentation, obviously there's representatives from Auckland Transport that that are that, that are listening uh, to you and also dialed in on the call. But uh, could I just perhaps pick up a little bit on? I didn't, didn't quite catch what you thought the average cost per speed uh, table was. Um, and, I, and my question is around that kind of whatever that figure is, Jeff. Uh, you know, you just touched on about the opex and the maintenance side of things. Obviously, those uh, building those um, uh, speed bumps would be out of a capital um, spend budget. So, have you got any uh, ideas about if there if there was to be redeployed that capital spend? What uh, what you thought that might go into uh, rather than the speed bump? If that's clear. Uh, so the average price or, or the price which I've seen uh, through the local board documentation and other publicly available documentation uh, around raised pedestrian speed tables is uh, a figure of $260,000. So, so that's uh, just over a quarter of a million dollars per raised pedestrian speed table. So it's a huge amount of money. I mean, you can buy a high-end sports car for that. Um, and, and in actual fact, if, if we use some of these uh, cheaper methods of sealing unsealed roads, that would go 2.6 kilometres, uh, theoretically. Um, so the next question, OPEX and CAPEX, uh, you know, like I, I, I have some financial difficulties of my own, and while I'd love to put aside some money for a new car, um, you know, and call that CAPEX, you know, I have to use everything I've got available just to put uh, food on my table and diesel in my ute. So if we have to juggle CAPEX and OPEX uh, in order to catch up on some of the overdue road maintenance, um, you know, so be it. You know, when we're talking about CAPEX at the moment, the only thing we seem to be uh, building is speed bumps and, and the community doesn't want that. So if we, had to t if we had to cancel some speed bumps to catch up on some overdue road maintenance, clearing, clearing some drainage uh, and, and resealing the roads to, to get rid of the potholes, um, I think the community would support that, certainly in the short term. Um, hey, thank you so much for your question, Greg. Really appreciate hey, it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for those answers. Uh, we have a motion on the screen now, moved by Councillor Sayers, seconded by Councillor Lee, to receive the public input from Jeff. Upson, and to thank him for attending. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Thanks very much, Jeff. Thank Final you. presenters uh, 
in public input today uh, come in the form of Tony Skelton and Greg McEwen, who appear before us on behalf of the Coalition of Concerned Auckland Communities, and they will be talking regarding the uh, infrastructure issues uh, currently being faced by Auckland Council and no doubt exacerbated by events of the last couple of weeks. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, the talk button is to, is to your right. Uh, when you're ready, away you go. Good morning. Thank you, Mr Chairman, for the opportunity to address you this morning. Uh, I am Tony Skelton, and my colleague on my right is Greg McEwen. We are both long-standing residents of Auckland, and our role today is simply to be the messengers. The people we are representing are really concerned about the state of this city's infrastructure and its apparent lack of ability to cope with current and future demands. The purpose of our attendance is to present a petition signed by 30 community groups representing, requesting Council to withdraw Plan Chain 78. Recent weather events have demonstrated the inadequate capacity and condition of Auckland's wastewater and stormwater infrastructure for today's housing, let alone the type of intensification promoted by Plan Chain 78. Insurance industry professionals have estimated that claims could exceed $1 billion. Add to that all the consequential social and economic costs of, late, of the late January flood and future climate predictions, the reality hits home. The Council needs to rethink Plan 78. Developing urban transport, water, wastewater, stormwater and other infrastructure should be an evidence-based optimisation exercise which takes into account characteristics which are unique to a city, the outcomes sought and the funding available. This government's one-size-fits-all legislation takes away Auckland Council's ability to plan as Auckland's needs and is particularly problematic when it comes to infrastructure. The unitary plan agreed by Aucklanders in 2016 took a more focused approach to intensification, actually making it easier and more cost effective to use existing infrastructure and develop new infrastructure. We need a transport and water infrastructure audit to determine op options which are fundable and practicable. Given recent events, it would be irresponsible for Council to proceed with a major plan change before that audit is completed. The attached petition, signed by 30 community organisations and represents thousands, thousands of ratepayers request that Council withdraws Plan Change 78. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Tony, uh, Greg, have you got anything to add to that, or I just want to open the floor to questions at this stage? Okay, yes, yeah, so we have a, a couple of uh, questions uh, in the name of Councillor Walker and Councillor Newman. Um, sure, I understand you've done some investigation around costings. Are there any costings that you're familiar with that Auckland Council has done in respect of the cost of addressing the infrastructure issues and specifically stormwater and sewage that you've identified? No, I'm not aware of that. Can you repeat that? I'm not aware of that. Thank you. Councillor Newman? Um, thank you very much. I I'm, I'm certainly don't want to cast myself on the role of pilot here, but um, whilst I have some real sympathy for the argument on Plan Change 78, um, to an extent, this council uh, and other councils um, are having to respond to the direction set down by Parliament with respect to giving effect to the NPSUD, yeah. its objectives and policies. I would certainly want to see Parliament um, act to um, rescind 
um, a, a number of aspects of the legislation that was passed um, uh, with both sides of the House agreeing. But what I want to know is, is what is Parliament's obligation in your eyes um, to enable councils to act with confidence that Plan Change 78 can be withdrawn and that we could default back to the existing Auckland Unitary Plan, which is in itself arguably um, not sufficiently contextualised on evidence given that we've seen um, these drainage catchments not holding up. If I could take that, Tony. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Auckland Council has the obligation, first and foremost, to do what's best for Auckland. And we've seen uh, Christchurch do something different in terms of leadership, and that they, they are um, developing a different intensification plan, which doesn't have, in particular, the MDRS obligations in it. Um, so the enabling legislation, uh, I think, in Section tw uh, 80, uh, says in black and white that once an IPI process has been notified, it can't be withdrawn. But I think that's a small contest for council to, to take on. Um, and uh, that needs to be done, and I think there are probably levers that council can, can do. But what, what the, what the um, petition asked for is it to be withdrawn, but at a minimum, a stopping of the process and an audit, because if, if we looked at, for instance, your Section 32s in, in council's own work, um, there's, there's no examination in the Section 32s of what happens at the bottom of a catchment when you build uh, far more intensely at the top of a catchment. And the, you know, we've got a, a point at point four where we say, you know, you need some evidence-based um, approaches. It's all, all right to design all those houses, but it's, if it's impracticable or unfundable in the future or not efficient because there are other more efficient options to build houses elsewhere, we shouldn't be building in that, in that catchment. Final question, Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Chair. A quick one. Um, would your organisation support more housing to be enabled in places that aren't flood prone and less housing for places that are? We're representing the organisations with respect, Mr. Councillor, uh, Mr. Henderson, but we can't answer on behalf of 30 organisations. Um, OK, to, I to follow up, because I'm, I'm a bit confused. So does your organisation discuss the issue of flood prone areas? Um, I'm unclear as to why this this has come to us in in that case. Why 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 it's come is because 30 community groups, and it's really just the top of an iceberg. Um, 30 community groups have enough concern about Plan Change 78 because they've looked at the lack of examination of infrastructure and a cost benefit analysis and a practicability of building in some areas. And um, in particular, the MDRS of the uh, half of the um, equation is, is more problematic than intensifying around cor corridors and, and uh, centres. You know, Arab, Arab have done a study recently that says, you know, from Nairobi to New York, we, Auckland, are the most a spongible city there is at the moment in the world in a, in a study. If we're the most spongible, and if you look what's happened, and we've got a plan that actually makes us less spongible by implementing MDRS everywhere, then we should stop and look, even if, if, if you want to run that argument, we should stop and look at what we're doing, because it hasn't been, it hasn't been argued or discussed. All that, all that Plan Change 78 has done so far is take a qualifying matter and say we're going to um, account in, with respect to stormwater, account for 551 properties that are currently in floodplains. That's not what we're talking about. That's today's floodplains. What we're talking about is the ability to uh, match the provision of infrastructure, stormwater, wastewater, transport with land development. And there's been no consideration of that. OK, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Mayor, wrap this up. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I've had the sympathy with that. I would like to see if we can refer this to the planning committee because the planning committee is actually undergoing a review 
of what we're going to learn from the last two or three weeks of impacts. And so it's probably, and it's a, you, you're asked for a planning solution to a degree to a um, physical problem. But we are having a discussion on that thing, so I'd like to get the, chair, the chairperson to refer this to the other committee. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly in respect of the petition, uh, you know, we're happy to pass that on to the, the planning committee given, given the request. Okay, th thank you very much, Tony and Greg, for that uh, excellent presentation. Councillor Fletcher uh, would like to move that we receive the input from Tony Skelton and Greg McEwen regarding infrastructure issues and, and thank them for attending the meeting. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Lee, all those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to um, all our presenters and public input today. There was a very high quality of presentation and um, I, I just would like to make the point that that information as presented in a number of instances will form the basis of uh, ongoing discussions. Um, so uh, please be assured that if there is a, a, a follow-up to the exact material, certainly in respect of the ferries there will be, it will be communication from, the communi uh, from this committee back to you. Okay, thank you. We, we now uh, move on with the agenda today. We have uh, not received uh, any local board input. Um, there are no extraordinary items. Um, so that will move us straight into the agenda proper, item eight, which is the uh, Waka Kaitahi NZTA update. And online we have Nicole Rosie, the uh, Chief Executive, uh, with us today in person, we have Steve Martin, who is the Director of Regional Relationships and is always a very happy to fa face to see because Steve's always there either opening up new projects or concluding ones that have been in operation for years. So um, it's always a nice association when we see you, Steve. And finally, Randia Karma, who is uh, the Regional Manager System Design. So the purpose of this item today is to really to receive the update from Waka Kotahi. Uh, on its Auckland program and to, to really kick off what we hope is going to be an ongoing relationship with this committee and with Auckland Transport. I welcome uh, Mark Lambert to the table as well. So uh, I'll leave it over to you, Steve, to do the introductions and to proceed with the uh, presentation, which is also available on Nexus. Uh, Tina Koto, uh, Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity for joining the Transport and Infrastructure Committee this morning. Uh, we really value this opportunity to have this relationship with you uh, from Wakatai perspective and also to be at the table here in partnership and collaboration with Auckland Transport. Uh, look, you've done the introduction as well, so thank you for that. I'll pass over to Nicole, our Chief Executive, who will run through a short presentation for you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, no mai, haere mai, kei te rangatira tēnā um, uh, Hello and welcome. Um, firstly, just to acknowledge uh, Steve, who is our Director of Regional Relationships in uh, Auckland and the Upper North, and uh, has done a tremendous job for Wakatahi. Also, Mark Lambert, uh, my colleague, uh, worked very closely with Mark um, and uh, also the members of the AT Board who are um, involved in the committee here today. Uh, it is um, wonderful to have the opportunity to talk to you today uh, around uh, the work that we're doing together in Auckland and the role of Waka Katahi in that. Um, so if you move to the next slide. Um, we are, uh, the reason I'm not there today, as you're very aware, I think, that we're in the middle of some unprecedented weather events across the country, very, very significant, um, and they are having quite significant impacts um, in Auckland, 70 local roads still out, which Mark will no doubt have talked to you about, uh, but we also have some flooding, flooding still on State Highway 16 and Dome Valley. More broadly, in the rest of the country, we have some very significant large-scale impacts, which will require a very coordinated and large-scale response. And so I think the presentation today probably should be contextualised within that context because we have quite a changing um, environment in terms of immediate priorities for New Zealand in the transport space. But within that context, I just want to acknowledge the very strong partnerships we have in Tamaki Makaura. Um, we are working very closely together and have, um, I think, really built our relationships over the last three years to quite a different level from what they have been historically. We share nationally and locally very significant transport challenges. 
uh, and I will talk about those shortly, very significant trade-offs and how we manage uh, those challenges. And we are all um, dealing with a very um, large ambition to do climate change, safety, and to build our cities in a, um, in a modern and reliable way in an environment where we all have funding constraints. So it is a very challenging environment. We are in the process of delivering our 2021 uh, 21 to 24 National Land Transport Program and Associated Plan. Uh, but we are um, uh, also looking at what we're doing with the next National Land Transport Plan and obviously working with the government on its broader transport program with around 50 to 60 percent of funding for transport now coming directly from government. The National Land Transport Program now forms only about 50% of the funding that is occurring in the transport system in New Zealand. So if I move on to the next slide, um, we have some very big ambition and some very big challenges that we're seeking to address through the transport system in New Zealand and in Auckland. Uh, and this slide outlines both the problems and uh, the outcomes we're seeking. Um, so we're looking to provide more travel options for people. We have uh, committed as a nation to the um, climate, climate neutral New Zealand by 2050 and therefore climate change both in terms of emission reduction but also in terms of adaptation has become an increasingly important focus for the transport system. We are 18% of the emissions profile of New Zealand will be responsible for 50% of the emission reduction targets and, and hence it's transport yeah. sector. Uh, Nicole, you might have to, we've got a bit of alarm going here. I've been told that, so, so, so we'll just adjourn the meeting and uh, no evacuate outside and then Resume hopefully in due course. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on. The, the, the emergency is current transport policy settings. Stay online or log off? I think those online should just stay because we'll be on the same yeah, link. The council's online. I, uh, you maybe just stay online and keep abreast of developments. Thank you.
Okay, second time lucky, or well, reconvene the meeting. Welcome everyone back. I hope all our councillors online um, uh, kept abreast of things. The immediate crisis, whatever it may have been, seems to have been resolved. Sorry about that interruption, Nicole. Um, so we'll just uh, go back to you, just pick it up from wherever you think appropriate. Probably don't have to go back to the start, but we'll... Um, We'll just leave it to, to you to proceed in the manner you think suitable and um, continue with the presentation. Let's hope we get through it this time. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, yeah, yes, um, we're quite diverse now in crisis management, so it was good to see that there was not another event in Auckland requiring you to um, manage that, so ni nice to um, have the committee back. So just on this slide, this slide is really just about the complexity of trade-offs we have, um, and I was talking about the size and scale of the climate challenge. We also are near the bottom of the OECD in our safety performance as a nation and have a lot of work to do. And at the same time, as we're all aware, um, uh, our communities are looking for transport choice. We're all focused on access and connectivity, growth, and, uh, and also equity aspects of the changes that will happen with climate and other things. So we're in a situation of many outcomes we're wanting to achieve with limited funding to achieve those outcomes, which really means we're in a, a situation of uh, very significant trade-off choices. To sort of help navigate those choices, um, uh, Wakatahi a few years ago started work on Arataki, which is uh, initially a 10-year document looking at a, a view of New Zealand and each of the regions in New Zealand and uh, how we saw growth occurring and what would happen to those networks as a result of that growth. That information that's informed that for um, your yeah, for Auckland is uh, the information coming out of our Joint Intelligence um, Centre. It's also been informed by border inputs like Infocom and other groups that have been looking at intelligence, Stats New Zealand, etc., on what uh, likely future population trends are in New Zealand. It, it is on a 30-year horizon. It incorporates uh, known uh, agreed programs of work, which for uh, Tamaki Makara, uh, ATAP, uh, which is the Auckland um, Transport Action Plan, Future Connect, and your Regional Land Transport Plan, which you agree uh, you prioritise work program for. And it also includes the three-year uh, National Land Transport View. Future Connect um, is a 10-year system um, planning tool for Auckland, which integrates all of the transport systems. So one of the significant changes that happened in the National Land Transport Framework, and actually which Wakatahi and AT and others have been working on over the last three years, is the integration of all a view, integrated views of all transport networks, how we're working together across all systems um, in New Zealand, including in Auckland. And uh, so Future Connect is uh, the start of us uh, showing those fully integrated networks for the region. So it sets out strategic networks. I'm going to show you a little bit of that later for each transport mode. Uh, outlines the deficiencies, the opportunities, and identifies focus areas for further investigation. And uh, it's been developed by uh, ourselves, AT, Auckland Council, Mana Whenua, MOT, KiwiRail, Kaingora, and other major stakeholders, um, Freight Reference Group, the Road Safety Governance Group, Bike Auckland, um, Automobile Association, and Living Aotearoa have all contributed to the development of those um, documents. If you go to the next slide, what you have, and there was a bit of a comment when someone left the room, I think, to say, the policy and planning framework um, might, be, might be a challenge. What we have is quite a lot of planning and policy documents in New Zealand, and this diagram just shows it. So the, the transport investment um, frameworks are complex, and there is multiple documents that are inputting into those frameworks at the moment. Uh, you'll be aware, if we move on to the next slide, that um, we are working on a joined-up view across central and um, Tamaki Makaura of uh, of an Auckland transport plan, and that is really about bringing that work, which already exists, actually in many cases is quite done and done at quite a level of detail together in a single um, document that has an integrated view of future um, transport networks um, and and options within that for the for the Auckland region. So that's work that's undergoing at the moment, and I know is a key priority for the Auckland Mayor and our minister to um, to line up on that. But I uh, just reiterate, actually, there's been an enormous amount of work done in the three years, um, and I'll come back to that shortly, 
on uh, transport networks, the integration of those transport networks in Auckland and the plan around how you might bring this together. Um, within that context, if you just keep moving, uh, next slide. Um, one of our biggest challenges uh, for all of us is funding. And whilst there has been a record 7.3 billion um, forecast investment uh, into Auckland and the National Land Transport um, Program for this three year period, you'll see your line there, it's the highest one. You may not be able to see the slide properly, but the right hand index is how much of you, what you requested in the 21 to 24 National Land Transport Program was given to your region. And it shows that Auckland got 97% of what it asked for. On the right-hand side is all the other regions, and they they got down to about 60% of what they asked for in this regional land transport plan. You got 97%, and then the substantial um, difference in that was funded has has been funded directly by government through top-ups of the um, the Eastern Busway and cycling projects through other funds. So relative to other regions in New Zealand, uh, Auckland has had a significant share of the National Land Transport Fund. And in the, the next um, three to 10 year period, um, is getting somewhere in the order to 40 to 50% of the planned investment in transport networks in New Zealand. So we the number uh, is over the next 10 years is around $37 billion. Um, 16.3 billion of that will come from the Land Transport Fund. So as you can see from those numbers, the balance is being directly funded by government. Um, so um, it's really just to say, uh, there has been quite a, a significant investment in Auckland and the Auckland region from the funds that are available over this three year period uh, and a real prioritisation towards the Auckland uh, ATAP and, uh, and other big projects in the Auckland region. Underpinning that, if you move to the next slide, has been a series of integrated strategies that we've been working on looking at what are the future networks um, for, for Auckland. So the, these are just three diagrams that show um, the roading network for Auckland, um, the heavy rail and rapid transit, there's much more detailed um, plans sitting behind these and cycling and mobility networks. And, and these have all fed in to those planning documents we've just talked about, um, particularly ATAP for the 10 year view, but uh, certainly the broader um, perspectives being put into large transport investments for the region. And uh, they're the basis on which we've, we've been working together across transport modes to um, look at how we plan networks, but also to prioritise investment in these networks. Part of what has been happening over the last three to five years is a lot of work on how we integrate these networks and how we leverage the power of fully integrated networks, or as the case may be, in, a, in the case of cycling networks, having a network uh, so that we can actually support people to shift um, out of uh, their, their cars or to use cycling as an alternate transport mode for some of their trips. And we know the most significant thing that changes people's behaviour around cycling and even public transport is the ability to be able to use a dedicated network and safely use that network. So there has been a real priority on starting to be quite focused and systematic in the way that we deliver integrated networks for Auckland. I will reiterate again, the challenge of this is that the limited funding means we can only do a portion or some of these networks. And, and so there is a, a number of decades of work required for us to fully deliver on the vision of these plans that we're currently doing. Move to the next slide, please. So uh, we have been actively working together. There are certainly opportunities for us to continue to grow our partnerships and to work um, much more closely together in, in the future. Uh, but we have been, uh, ATAP is an example of multi-agencies working together um, to agree, prioritise plan for transport in Auckland. AT and ourselves are working together on alliances and multiple projects. We have the Supporting Growth Alliance that's looked at um, key development and growth areas in Auckland. Um, and, and so there has been a lot of uh, active planning and uh, work happening in partnership together. Another example actually would be the National Ticketing System, where uh, Auckland is part of a partnership across the country to develop an integrated um, national ticketing framework for New Zealand. We've also been um, deeply working together on asset management and resilience um, strategy 
policy and response. You may not be aware that there is a national resilience plan out for consultation at the moment. We have worked with all councils to set up a standard asset management framework for New Zealand in the last two years, um, which will allow us to have much greater visibility and comparative data on the state of our assets in New Zealand than we've previously had. And uh, Tamaki Makaura has been deeply involved in um, supporting and providing input into those frameworks and documents, which are national documents, but obviously have a significant um, implication for Auckland and uh, Auckland will want to use those documents as it's developed as it develops its future um, program planning and um, funding frameworks. We're also doing collaborative infrastructure delivery and northwestern interim um, bus improvements are an example of that. And we have multi-party groups set up and working together on the rapid transit networks, White Tamata, um, Second Crossing, Northwest Rapid Transport, Airports Botany, and um, both Shane Ellison and myself were on uh, the Auckland Light Rail Governance Board with Mark Lambert now being involved in the uh, the group along with us that is um, involved in being advised around that project. So uh, with some of the complexity in how these projects are now funded and set up, we do have multiple project governance structures and um, have worked very hard actually to build uh, integrated um, re re representative and uh, reflective governance structures uh, that reflect the fact that these are Auckland Tamaki Makaura projects. They need to be led and owned by Auckland and we are here to support you in delivering on what is one of New Zealand's um, key assets, um, our, our largest city, our most dynamic and growing city and the uh, most important city um, in terms of our connection to the rest of the world. So. I'll stop there and just uh, let you ask any questions. Thanks very much, Nicole, for that um, very comprehensive presentation. And as members will see, uh, NZTA, Waka Kotahi is such a, an important player in our transport network. I, I'm, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to sharing that relationship and, and at some point uh, sooner rather than later once uh, you know the current challenge is over is actually getting out and doing some site visits to see some of these major projects and investments that are occurring. So I'll open it up to uh, any questions that, that members may have now and I, I just before I do I, I just make the point we've got a, a very large number of quite lengthy and significant and detailed presentations today so so I'd really appreciate if we could please keep our questions reasonably succinct so so we can move through um, what is quite a, a a large number of substantial items today so with that in mind uh, well the question is we've got now is councillor Newman Simpson Darby and and Lee and Ferry councillor Newman uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Rosie. Can I just a couple of questions from me? I mean, I know that there has been conjecture about whether will it or won't it with the NZ up, but can I understand uh, what is Waka Kotahi's professional opinion with respect to um, the completion of the Four Mill Road corridor? Uh, just uh, New Zealand Up projects are um, government-funded projects. It is uh, uh, the role of Wakatahi to deliver those on behalf of government, and we have no no decision-making rights in relation to those projects. So um, I'm not in a position to offer you an opinion. I actually don't have a view on that. That will be a decision of government as to how they would like to invest in those projects in South Auckland. With respect to the GPS, you've indicated the forthcoming GPS and set out what you would um, identify in the flagship requirement, which is reduced uh, emissions reduction. Um, how quickly is um, the organisation able to pivot in the event that there is a change of government, there's a different approach with respect to the GPS? Yes, uh, well, that's exactly what we've been setting ourselves up to do. Um, you know, these outcomes we're looking for as a nation, climate, safety, sustainable and resilient networks can cannot um, be achieved in a three-year election cycle. Um, they need to be, uh, we need to have sustainable um, programs of work that we can 
um, invest in and deliver over time with some certainty for our supply chain, but mostly to achieve the outcomes we want as a nation. If we don't have some continuity, we won't achieve those outcomes. So we have been um, setting ourselves up to be able to be very flexible in the program that we deliver within the plan. Uh, should there be a uh, change in government, irrespective of the flavour of the, that government. Um, in terms of our program, uh, we are we have active plans across all modes, across all networks. Uh, we can um, quickly identify what we, what each region and city sees as their strategic priorities within um, that plan and can quickly pivot based on the government of the day's priorities in any of those networks now to deliver what they would like. Councillor Darby. Thanks, Chair. Just finding the buttons there. Kia ora, Nicole. Hey, uh, Nicole, at the outset, I just want to thank you and uh, all your whole team for the response, um, of course, right now in the Hawk ba Hawke's Bay, but, um, you know, previously Northland across Auckland, um, you, you know, I, I, I found myself having to travel back from Northland uh, uh, 10 days ago and I think, uh, um, you know, passed 100 slips on your network and your people were out there, you know, in double quick time. Um, big challenges for you now. I really appreciate your time here today because I know it's uh, you've got other pressing matters. Just on that, it feels like the paradigm has changed, Nicole, particularly due to yesterday in the Hawke's Bay, you know, more than us. And um, it, it feels like... Um, you know the funding sources uh, and the fund and the spends are going to be you know dramatically different. They're going to have to be different because you are facing probably billions just in the Hawks Bay. Um, can you just give us a a sense of now because I think we need to be prepared for it changing. Um, I know it's probably too early to call numbers, but can you just give us a sense of the enormity? that you as the chief executive and your board are likely to be facing in delivering on on promises and plans yeah thank you chris um look the first thing to just acknowledge is um we have actually been looking at this uh we have been very uh, focused on uh, working with government on a funding review we have been identifying for some time that there is a significant gap between the revenue that we have in the system and the, the need of that system um, in terms of sustaining the levels of service we currently have, but certainly to make those large objectives we have as a nation and, and the customer service levels our communities expect into the future. So that gap prior to this event um, between what we know is, is likely in forecast revenue and what um, what what is already on the plan really in the next 10 years is in the order of 30 to $40 billion. Now you overlay these events and it's even more significant. And I, and I think if you look at the work we've done on resilience and we've done resilience plans for, for uh, it's out from consult consultation at the moment, but just really simply, larger culverts, stronger bridges, uh, bigger retaining walls, or in some places, relocating roads. Reinstatement um, will not solve those problems to the same level. So you will be talking about probably in the order at a minimum of three to five times what an existing reinstatement would cost. And in some cases, depending on the network, you might be um, 10 times that. And those numbers are just indicative and I, it would be dangerous to put those into the public domain in the sense of a media story because they're simply not quantified at the moment for this event. But uh, I think it is um, it is worth uh, can, um, everybody reflecting that the numbers are a lot more significant if we are wanting to, we're really rebuilding our networks to be far more resilient um, and that would cost, that will cost money. A lot of money. Good question. Thanks, uh, Noel. All the best in that area. Councillor Simpson. Thanks, Chair. Um, Steve, Randy, Nicole, thank you and welcome. Um, I, my question is for you, Nicole, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, could you possibly give us an update on the MOT review, um, sorry, revenue review, because obviously this will shape uh, the future investment right throughout the country, but specifically for Auckland as well. Have you got anything on that? Uh, that review has been led by MOT and Treasury, so they'd be the right people to come and speak to the committee about it. I can tell you that the initial report back from that committee has happened um, from MOT and Treasury to ministers. So they would be the right uh, group to come and talk to you about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Lee. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to talk about your 
you're challenging transport mission for Auckland, Tamaki Makauru, um, you, which obviously is, is quite complex, quite complicated. You um, also mentioned the light rail project or light rail limited, which you're involved in. Um, as I understand it now, the projected cost of that is 14.6 billion, and uh, some treasury is it that uh, is saying that it could go up to 29 billion. But leaving that aside, one thing we know for sure is 60 million has already been spent, but not one centimetre of of track laid. Have, can I ask you, it, the project is for Aucklanders, for Aucklanders, has uh, Waka Kotahi ever polled or surveyed Aucklanders in general about their views? And I'm not talking about controlled um, consultation groups or focus groups, but pol polling the general public to get their view on the priority of this project. Uh, so, again, I'm not the right party to talk about Auckland Light Rail. The government has set up a standalone entity, Tommy Parker, as the chief executive of the Light Rail unit, and um, he is tasked um, by uh, the, the government, Minister Wood, to deliver that project on behalf of New Zealand. My role and that of Shane Allison was actually in the establishment unit phase before the the entity was set up. So those questions about the cost and other things, you'd be best to direct to um, that unit. You, you brought a question about what are the transport preferences of Aucklanders. I, AT has done a lot of that work in that space. I don't know that there has been a, a, a general poll of the nature that you talk about polling on transport options and choices. I can tell you that there has been a tremendous amount of uh, community polling and input into the light rail um, project, but you'd have to direct your questions to Tommy as to exactly how those polls were can conduct it. And there is, and Thank you. there is quite Thank a you. large amount of community support. Thank you. you did mention it yourself and your involvement in the project. And look, my statement around costs were not questions. Thank you. Okay, so, and uh, just worth noting that Auckland Light Rail, we will be getting along to present to the committee. Okay, I'm aware that uh, Nicole has, has another appointment she uh, has to get to very soon. So could we quickly finish off with Councillors Ferry and Hills, please? Thank you. Uh, so my question is in relation to where um, Waka Kotahi has um, part funded or fully funded projects, but they haven't yet been delivered by AT. Uh, so what um, measures are Waka Kotahi looking at for um, putting pressure on AT to deliver? Uh, what type of timeframes are we looking at with some of those projects? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I, you, um, you'll be aware we sit on the AT board. I'm the representative on the AT board for uh, Wakatahi. So I'm quite across uh, the projects that are, uh, are are being delivered and together, I guess, um, or funded at least in part by Wakatahi within the AT program of work. And I can tell you from having sat on the board, there is a lot of tension in that, um, that board around what's happening on those projects and the delivery timeframes. We also have our own board as Wakatahi that um, has to approve funding applications and will also have to review any escalation and cost on these projects and they put a lot of scrutiny across additional cost and time frame delays and uh, there is certainly a lot of questions and testing that goes back into uh, Auckland Transport but actually into any council in New Zealand that has escalation in their cost um, what, and what we're seeing at the moment um, is that the delivery environment is extraordinarily challenging. We have huge escalation across um, all aspects, actually, of construction delivery. We have a hugely constrained labour market. Um, we've had huge absences over the last year from COVID. And in your case, you've had lockdowns through a large part of the last year. So actually, the, the idea that these projects can just be set up and run um, uh, with all of the challenges of getting supplies, getting people, um, and the escalation levels that we're seeing, um, I, th I think is uh, probably just to reflect back to the committee, uh, probably an unrealistic expectation. Um, what we are all desperately trying to do is move these projects as fast as possible. We know that delivery is an absolutely critical focus for the council, for the mayor, for ministers and for New Zealand. And uh, um, there is a huge amount of work behind the scenes to dynamically move resources around to keep things moving with the constraints we're operating in. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hills. 
Thank you, Chair Watson. Um, thank you, Nicole. And once again, just thank you for your workers and contractors over the last three weeks in Auckland and North Island. Just phenomenal job and, and working alongside Auckland Transport as well. Thank you. Um, just I uh, guess it's a comment kind of following on from Councillor Darby. Sorry, a question. Do you feel you have um, enough direction or political input or um, do you feel like you have the ability to pivot faster than you already were on both mitigating and adapting to climate. So, you know, clearly everything's changed the last couple of years and even more the last three weeks. Um, are you able to be focusing climate on both emissions and adaption on both, all of your projects? Uh, so it's a really interesting question because I would say when you go back to trade-offs, you're also asking us to maintain all our networks, keep them open, keep them operating, um, so I would say we can absolutely pivot and we absolutely can do climate and we can absolutely deliver climate projects and we absolutely have the capability to do a lot more cycling, a lot more walking, a lot more mass transit. But you're also asking that we maintain our networks, that we continue to improve service and access on those networks, that we upgrade those networks and there isn't enough money to do all of that. So the challenge is absolute trade-offs. Do you maintain your networks? and upgrade them and make them resilient for the future? Or do you invest in walking, cycling, cycling and public transport choice? We need to do them both, but with insufficient money to do them all, we are in trade-offs. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's the real challenge for operating agencies who are being asked to do them all, uh, but don't actually have sufficient resources, um, and I think the nation probably doesn't, for the level of um, investment that will be required to do them all. Uh, that's a bit about money, it's also just about capacity in the system. So I think that is a real challenge for the committee, it's a real challenge for all boards actually to consider in this space, because we are in trade-off choices. That's, that's a great answer and the, and the one I was hoping for. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nicole. And just very finally, uh, our Mayor has a question he, he wants to ask. Thanks, Nicole. Look forward to seeing you next week. Um, a shortage of cash means um, more of a focus on value for money. Um, everything's a trade-off. Uh, we have perhaps sunk too much in elaborate motorways, uh, whereas uh, and more in uh, it's more of a spreading the marmite a bit further than some of the other ones. There has, has a history um, of Waka Kotahi and government departments overestimating the budget benefits of projects and underestimating the costs. So I, I want to um, see that there's a hard-nosed approach to value for money, the sort of stuff that my background comes from. I'm sure you're going to be concentrating on that. That's how you're going to get your trade-offs. I welcome that, Mia, and I would also say that um, the Infocom and multiple other parties have looked at the factors that are most influential on effective program and project delivery, and they are consistently, consistently consistency in the plan, consistency in the scope and outcomes that are wanted to be achieved and sticking to that program of work at the start of a project or program of work. They are some of the biggest game changers in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. And then secondly, I completely agree with you, having a much heavier focus on efficiency and effectiveness and um, delivery. And I would just reflect back to you that if we could get five to 10 year certainty in funding for key things like median barrier delivery, like numbers of bridges we're going to replace, like the amount of uh, improvement activity that, that would be needed on our networks, then we could absolutely get you percentages and significant percentages of efficiency within our supply chain and delivery models. So, and, and that we see that in Australia and other places that have been able to give that level of uncertainty. So I encourage this committee uh, to really think about how we together can work on uh, giving that level of certainty to some aspects of our funding um, requirements to enable us to give the efficiency that you would like. Yeah, I'll join you next week in a few examples of how we can get more for the money. Thank you uh, very much, Nicole, for your uh, very informative uh, presentation today. Steve, is there, is there anything else anyone else wants to add from your front? 
No, I don't think so. We just really value the opportunity to uh, talk with you today. So thank you. Well, uh, and thank you for coming along. And I just would say to the committee, this this is the start of an ongoing process here, uh, one of which hopefully we inform ourselves uh, a lot more as to what Waka Kutahi is doing and, and how it relates to our transport network. So we really welcome your presence today, Nicole, and, and we look forward to seeing more of you and, and your team um, as the year progresses. So thank you very much. Um, I have a recommendation that is moved by Councillor Fletcher, uh, second by myself, to uh, receive the update from uh, Waka Kotahi. Um, I now uh, obliged to, to open up to, to debate, but, but I'm assuming uh, most of the relevant content was uh, covered in the questions. Um, so uh, is that a correct assumption? Does, does anyone want to make a comment? Yes. Make, make it quick, Council. Walker, Very quick, please. Mr Chair. We heard a presentation this morning giving some specific examples of how to complete a network at dramatically less cost. I just wonder whether that sort of information consideration is being factored by Waka Katahi. Thank you. OK, thank you. It's been moved. It's been seconded. Um, all those in favour, say aye. Aye. Those against? Carried. Thank you again, uh, Nicole, and, and the Waka Kotahi members, Randir and Steve, and, and Mark Lambert. Thank you very much for your presence today. So we'll now move on to item nine, which is an update on the Wairamata Harbour Connections project and the upcoming consultation, with the reference on, really, on, uh, emphasis, I should say, on the, on the consultation. We have Duncan Humphrey, who's the project director, and um, also in attendance, David Dunlop, the Alliance Director, Elise Webster, the Partner Interface Manager, Daniel Newcomb, uh, also Partner Interface Manager, Catherine Martin, Communications and Engagement, and Lucy Timmers, Communications and Engagement. And basically the purpose just to receive a presentation uh, from the project who will update um, on, on the project and specifically on the upcoming consultation. So I'll, I'll throw it over to the team. Perhaps uh, the lead person can introduce themselves uh, and we can proceed to the presentation. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Uh, Duncan Humphrey, as you say, I'm the Waka Kutahi Project Director. Um, and uh, I would just like to say thank you very much for allowing us to come here and give you an update. On our project, it's been a very busy period of time for the project um, mm -hmm. over the last six months, uh, and there's quite a bit to talk about, but also there's some very important things coming up. So uh, the purpose, as I say, is to give you a status update, um, to give you, I guess, an update on the context for the project as well, um, and importantly, to talk about our upcoming public consultation, uh, and particularly opportunities as well that um, you may know about that we haven't yet uh, uncovered to, uh, to engage with communities. We've been doing a similar thing with local boards and asking the same question. Um, and uh, we obviously want to give you an opportunity to ask questions about the project as well. So you will hear in some, in, you'll hear sort of background context, but you'll also get to understand what this phase is looking at in some detail. First thing to note is that this is very much a strong partnership uh, approach on this project. Uh, we are well aware that this is a, is a very long-term city shaping project that has, has to integrate very carefully with the land use, um, the growth, and ultimately the owners and operators of some of the infrastructure that we provide, um, but also recognising that Te Watamata has a very unique cultural significance to Mana Whenua. Um, they are also very strong project partners uh, on this on this program. Uh, it's intuitive, but um, it's worth highlighting that although the project area focuses on uh, Auckland, uh, central Auckland, but also up to, up to the North Shore, um, it is very much a regional, inter-regional, and national significantly uh, significant project. This is a, as, you, as you're aware, this is a gateway uh, for Northland to the rest of the country um, and vice versa. Uh, and, you know, the, the effects of um, crossing this harbour uh, or not uh, can be felt nationally, yeah, specifically in economic terms as well. So... Um, just a bit of context and background. So early in 2022, there wasn't a government announcement to bring forward 
planning for to watch Matar, watch Matar Harbour connections. Um, as I've mentioned, we've, we've set this up as a really strong partnership. We have commenced a, an, an indicative business case. In fact, we're uh, a, a more, almost halfway through that phase now. Um, and you'll, David will talk to you about that in some detail. Um, some of this is, is relevant from previous studies. Some of it is more up to date. This is a nationally significant high volume corridor. I don't need to talk too much about it, but it is the busiest part of the transport network in New Zealand. Um, and carries lifeline services and obviously is a major connection, as I've talked about, regionally. We're anticipating significant population growth on the North Shore. The numbers move around a bit, but we expect over the longer term the population to grow um, and demand to increase. Uh, and um, we are looking at this project in terms of all modes in this phase. So you will hear a bit more about that, um, but we're not considering simply rapid transit or freight. It's all together, all modes, um, walking, cycling, rapid transit, freight, general traffic. Uh, and how, in the long term, all of those modes will need to get across the harbour and end up into the North Shore. Um, it is intergenerational. As I've said, it's a very long... Um, this, this is an investment long term, 100 years. Uh, and um, it's important to, to emphasise that... Uh, uh, the delivery will take time, obviously, as well, but um, the, the study period itself is looking at modelling in the 30 to, to 50 year horizon. Um, just move on. So, a little bit about the strategic case, uh, which has been refreshed. Um, so, I guess these are reasonably self explanatory, but um, you know, accessibility is a problem. It is a problem uh, today, and it will become an increasing problem with that population growth. Um, we see increasing travel demand. We see freight stuck in congestion as well uh, during uh, inter-peak times, not just in peak times. But we see poor access to education opportunities, um, to employment, and even to recreational activities. And I say it seems to be more and more increasingly during the inter-peaks as well as the peak times. Um, poor travel choice. Uh, effectively, a heavy reliance on the private motor vehicle at the moment. Um, the Northern Busway is uh, sort of nearing capacity, uh, and um, travel choice is essential in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and offering low carbon transport choice. Uh, and obviously, that is highly topical given the evidence we, we are seeing increasingly and recently. Um, and then on that note as well, as I've mentioned, the strategic nature of this corridor and its importance, uh, and again, highly topical, we've seen the effects of climate change and, and the effects on uh, the transport network of the bridge being uh, either speed reduced or in some cases closed. And so we're well aware that there is a high dependence on one crossing um, with, the other, with another crossing being really infeasibly far away to keep the city moving. So um, the opportunities, they respond really to the problems. I guess um, we are dealing, as I've talked about our partnership with Auckland Council, we are dealing with something where we need to make sure that we are unlocking a uh, regional growth. We're unlocking growth in land use, but um, coordinated across the whole transport network and across the whole region. Um, improved quality of life through better access to employment. That's about the accessibility, education, healthcare, et cetera. Um, and uh, giving, as I've said, giving people choice as well helps um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and obviously, we by creating a more resilient network and more crossings for all modes, um, we're able to respond to events that we have seen recently more quickly and, and recover. So just to recap, um, before we move into some detail on the business case phase, uh, as I've talked about, we're looking at all modes. Um, something I haven't mentioned is one of the uh, work streams is to look at the funding and financing of this. And obviously, these things are expensive, but also to look at it um, in the context of all of the other projects and plans that you've heard about this morning um, and how New Zealand Inc. is able to afford this, um, and in particular, how it is staged to, um, to meet affordability. Uh, I should also mention as well that the study includes the, the long-term future of the Auckland Harbour Bridge as well and, and what we do with that ageing asset 
um, that is becoming increasingly expensive to maintain. We can keep maintaining it, but the disruption and the expense is, is, as we go on is more and more. So I will just hand you over to David Dunlop, who's going to talk about the uh, work that our alliance is doing on the indicative business case. Sure. Thanks, Eve Duncan. Um, so, yeah, as the Alliance Director, um, our job is to deliver um, what we are calling um, the indicative business case. So the, in, the business case process is complex, and I'm sure many of you are aware that you go through the multiple um, steps through that process. Um, so there's been a whole lot of prior work undertaken um, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, um, but also there was a significant amount of work done in 2019 and 2020 um, to look at um, our program business case. Um, we're now in what is called the indicative business case phase, and as Duncan's outlined, that is, has shifted in the sense that um, we're looking at all modes and, and all um, forms of um, movement um, across the North Shore. Um, I guess to really be important, though, to understand that we're not discarding that previous work. That work is being utilised and it's fundamental to the work that we're doing at the moment in, to, in developing this indicative business case. So this indicative business case um, will then set up a, 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 a network um, and a system um, and the modes um, for the North Shore and the access to, to and from um, State Highway 1. Uh, and then once we've done this work, um, we'll um, funnel, funnel down into more um, discrete projects um, at a detailed business case phase, assuming um, they are um, fundable um, and agreed um, in terms of approval process. So if we move to the next slide, Duncan. You've already heard Nicole talk to this um, slide, so I won't go into it in a huge amount of detail. However, it is fundamental um, to what we're looking at um, as part of the project. So it is about um, creating a, a transport system um, that is connected and is all about providing for the future. Um, so it's about how we integrate with the existing busway um, and how we tie in with all the other um, components of the rapid transit network. And the red line, as displayed in that um, diagram on the screen, um, is depicting the um, light rail connections that are envisaged. Um, and, and I would say that, just to be mindful, um, that line is just indicative of running, at the moment, running up and down that um, core spine of State Highway 1. So I probably won't go into any more detail because I think Nicole um, summarised it very well for you earlier. probably just move you on then to um, the related projects. And again, Nicole touched on a number of these, these projects. Um, and, but I think it's important to note um, that, you know, there are not only the rapid transit network projects, but we're also working to integrate with um, emissions reductions plans. Um, and also, um, probably important to point out, um, the NPS um, uh, for urban development. Um, and the importance of um, urban development in the consideration of any uh, rapid transit network and any um, transport system. Um, so yeah, I won't go into any more detail other than to say that this, is, this project is linked heavily to the, uh, the GPS um, and also um, the um, Auckland Transport Alignment Project, ATAC, that Nicole has already talked to earlier. I'll hand over now to Catherine. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou, everyone. So in terms of engagement, so we'd just like to give you a bit of an update on the project, share what we've heard from communities through recent results in a survey and talk about the upcoming consultation period as well. So firstly, just to note, as mentioned by Dave and Duncan, this project has significant reach. It's a future shaping for Tamaki Makoto and Aotearoa nationally. So as such, we're very keen to hear from a wide range of people and organisations as well, local communities, businesses, freight groups, as well as those interested both regionally and nationally. So we have undertaken some early engagement. That was late last year, uh, which I'll outline in a moment. And we're working hard to get ready for the engagement and consultation that's coming up in late March. Next slide, please. 
So this slide, just in terms of our early engagement, some of you may recall we attended a chairs forum last year and also we all, uh, was, were presenting at a local board's joint meeting just to outline the project and where we were at. Um, we also did hold a stakeholder breakfast, um, which was attended by the Minister of Transport. We also went to a number of schools and held some educational engagement that involved focusing the children um, on some future thinking uh, and related to the project and its outcomes. And it actually resulted in some really great feedback and some creative ideas. So in November and December last year, we undertook the community engagement at six local markets. So we headed along there. Uh, the purpose of this was to raise awareness of the project and inform the community of the strategic reasons for the project. We also wanted to explain how it fitted into the network, as um, Dave was showing that map earlier. We wanted to hear from the community via a survey which focused on understanding people's behaviours so that we could use that valuable information and the options analysis prior to the next round of engagement. Next slide. Please. So in terms of that survey, it, uh, we had 4,000 responses to that. Uh, this slide just touches on some of the feedback. Um, in terms of a couple of points there, so 30% of respondents currently um, advise us they cross the harbour by bus. 88% uh, said they would catch a bus or a train if they could. Um, reliability, speed and convenience were important to people in any public transport mode. And one of the strongest comments we got in the open, open feedback section was that they wanted to see some progress uh, happen on the project. Interestingly, um, to help people with the next phase of engagement, they would like to see information on cost, staging and mode. So that would be expected. So this will be taken into account in our next um, stage. Next slide. So looking ahead, looking ahead, we have consultation planned from late March. The questions are going to focus on what modes could be, what staging could be, and how this could be delivered. We have engaged, as um, was mentioned earlier, with a number of local boards to seek their advice on um, how we can reach those diverse communities. And we welcome uh, information from yourselves. Um, appreciate time, it's probably tight here, so maybe if you could uh, email it through, through Mr Chair, something like that. Any, any suggestions are welcomed. So in late March, we will send you uh, an information pack with links to the website and the survey, and we would be grateful if you could share those with your networks. Thanks very much. Heading back to you, Duncan. Yes, uh, th thanks, Catherine. So um, Dave outlined the timeline for this particular phase. It is it is a tight timeline. We are expecting to have our preferred option um, identified by the middle of the year. Uh, that will go into a report that will be um, finalised around September, which will then go into an approval process, uh, and hopefully we will see um, progression via approval of that business case to the next stage, the detailed business case, early in 2024. Um, so it's just an outline in more detail of this phase. So uh, I'll just, I guess, summing up, uh, it's important to remember that this is long term, particularly, um, for instance, uh, with walking and cycling, we're not looking at the temporary solution here or the interim solution. We're looking at the permanent solution and how people will use active modes to get across the harbour. Uh, and as I said, the study period is looking into the future and the assets will be 100 years plus worth of value. Um, it is considering all modes and it is considering them all together. And it's also in the context of looking at everything else that's happening on our transport network in the region and making sure that we're integrated with that, um, as well as how the city is planned uh, in the growth that we expect to see at a regional level. Um, in, in combination with other um, major projects, major transport infrastructure projects. Uh, it includes the future use of the Auckland Harbour Bridge um, in, in, uh, in the context of increasing maintenance and cost. Um, and it is responding to climate change. It is very much a, a, a key driver in the strategic case. case. Um, the emission, emissions reduction, VKT reduction, it, it is... Uh, heavily identified in, in our strategic case. Um, we have very strong governance around this, including with our partners, um, it's a key, key component, and it does require uh, uh, effective engagement with our stakeholders, but also the support and advocacy of our communities for ultimately the preferred option that we come up with. 
uh, we come up with together, I should say. Um, and it includes integration. It includes integration with Auckland Light Rail, so we have to be cognizant of Auckland Light Rail, um, and, it, and also Northwest Rapid Transit. Um, and as Dave showed you, we need to be aware of developments, for, uh, project developments on the um, strategic public net network, public transport network projects. So, um, and, and as we've said, uh, our um, key public consultation, our key engagement starts uh, officially on the, the 26th of March. So, um, hopefully that's given you a reasonably good idea of where we are and what we're doing and what's coming up. I'm really happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Duncan, uh, David and Catherine. Uh, very informative. We, we uh, Just a little note to councillors, we have endeavoured to get this in front of us at the earliest possible time in, in light of the consultation that's coming up starting at the um, end of March. Obviously, we will have to give some consideration as to how we might uh, more effectively uh, bring together the feedback from the councillors rather than just sort of some ad hoc responses here today. So, so we will do that and uh, uh, Barry Potter will come back to us at, uh, as soon as possible as to how we're going to coordinate that. So... Um, any questions uh, then that, that we have of the presenters, given the you know given the the rather limited scope that we've got today, um, we're, we're not going into actual options at this point. Councillor Hills, Councillor Walker. Thanks, Chair Watson. Uh, thank you all, um, and nice to see you out in the summer uh, at the some of the events. Um, and it's great to see the direction on multimodal, multimodal and sort of climate resilient and uh, climate emission reducing uh, modes. I guess I've got, and I'm sorry, Chair, three questions really quick. First question is around um, how you measure the uh, the effects on congestion right now, because as someone who crosses the bridge most days, the bridge itself is the least congested part of the network. So how do you take consideration the whole corridor um, and the effects of turning on, say, more lanes in the middle when actually the middle bit is mostly, unless there's an accident, free flowing. So how do you, you know, and what that means for the communities? Yeah, I can, I can probably answer that one, yeah, um, Councillor. Uh, ultimately, I mean, we use various uh, data sources that we work closely with Auckland Transport uh, on, um, at, but we also use um, tools and modelling tools. However, I just emphasise the point that this project is very much about the future, um, and we know that there's been um, changes in um, in, in um, travel, uh, especially associated with um, COVID. Um, and obviously, um, it, yeah, we're we're very much looking at a, a you know a, a future window and and the growth that is projected to happen. Thank you. The other question is on the um, the route. Um, how how far are you looking? You know that that red line keeps coming up, and everyone keeps saying it's just indicative. Because um, one of my reasons has always been because the western side has about double the um, residents currently, and a lot of growth um, than the other side, the eastern side. But the other issue is that line, as we saw a few Fridays ago. Um, and the floodplain mapping, that whole motorway and potentially future route is in a pretty significant floodplain, and not just the asset, but the potential to intensify may change in the future. So are you thinking of looking at how to move it into a different space? Because we may not have the catchment um, if we have to change our planning rules over time. Uh, so, yes, uh, we are. We are looking at... at uh, other areas and not just the utilisation of the existing corridor. Yeah. Um, we're also looking at that as well. So we are looking at, I should stress, basically we're looking at a multitude of options for where it goes. Um, in the study period, the study is up to Albany and, and uh, potentially up to Oro, as you see, but um, uh, we need to think about how it's staged as well in that context. So, um, but the, the short answer is we are looking at more than more than the utilisation of just the existing corridor. It is it is early state an early stage, so we need to be it needs to be based on some strong evidence. Okay, and you are able to pivot quickly, looking at what happened a couple of Fridays ago, could be happening we're, yeah, a lot more. We we are well aware of the impacts of what happened, and um, the team actually went out and had a look 
uh, and we, we are using that, we'll put that. Those are inputs to our optioneering and analysis process. Okay, thank you. And the last question, just um, is there ways to phase it to potentially leave other parts later? So if you ramped up walking, cycling and rapid transit quickly, you might not need to add or remove lanes off the bridge or, you know, like instead of yes. doing it all at once. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the optioneering process, stageability is one of the factors that has been considered. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Walker. So um, are you doing foresighting and backcasting with respect to significant technological changes that are underway? I'm referring to widespread electrification of the bus network, vehicle network, likely um, development of robo-taxis by Tesla and that model as it runs out and they're very advanced in that. Full self-drive, for example, that has had multi-billions of dollars invested in it. So what does the rollout of that do to this crossing and the nature of the crossing and, and quite obviously car sharing is part of that because that's part of the robo-taxi model that I'm assuming you're familiar with. So are you doing foresighting and backcasting across all of those things? And they're just some of um, what's underway. Thank you. Some of those technologies are certainly being, we are looking at. Um, some of them are not developed enough to be able to use meaningfully to guide what we're doing. So the ones, you know, the things that we, we can look at are um, changes in technologies for, for bus rapid transit, for instance, um, autonomous light rail vehicle, that sort of thing. Uh, but um, some of the other things you've mentioned, we don't have, I don't think, enough data and information to be able to use it meaningfully to guide optioneering, which are based on, uh, you know, the strategic needs are slightly higher. Perhaps if you could get back to me, because I'm interested in these issues, they're very much realities, um, and I'd like to know that and have some confidence that you are foresighting and backcasting. Thank you. Okay, you Councillor Lee, uh, Mayor Brown, and then finish up with Councillor Darby. Uh, Councillor Lee. Uh, thank you very much. I I'm just looking at, at the graphic up there, and... Um, I see that NZTA or Waka Kotahi is looking at a, a, a parallel um, rail system in Auckland. We are currently, as you would be aware, um, involved in an extremely heavy spend on a heavy rail tunnel, um, uh, the CRL uh, tunnel, uh, and yet up here we see um, the plans for a, a parallel almost competing system using a completely different mode. Be that as it may, that's um, you're the government and, and that's your choice. But you need to know this. Please do not call light rail uh, rapid transit. If you go to Australia and talk to people who actually are familiar with trams, because they build them, not just talk about them, um, they will tell you as, as I was told in, in a deputation of uh, AT managers and uh, directors a few years ago by Mr Phil Mumford of uh, the G-Link um, light rail on the Gold Coast, he said to us, remember this, guys, light rail is mass transit. It is not rapid transit. And really, you have to stop referring to trams as rapid transit because... Um, that's a fundamental error. And so my request is that you do go to, when you're talking about light rail, and put up pictures of trams, you go to Australia, and certainly I support light rail in its place, but not on, on long haul rapid um, connections. We have a system for that. We spend spending billions on it, and we should capitalise on that, that investment. Thank you. A uh, bit of, bit, bit of uh, feedback there. I don't think you have to um, res respond to that. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Darby. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, thanks, team, for this. Um, look, I, I realise, and, and, and good on him too, Minister Wood understood the interdependencies between the Auckland Light Rail project and this project. They're at slightly different stages. This is at IBC and the other one's at DBC. Um, and can you just give some assurance um, that, you know, they, they really are 
synchronizing as I think we would all expect. That's probably my first area. Um, and part of that question is, um, well, following on from that question is, will the analysis that you're undertaking now on a so-called multimodal solution, if the evidence indicates that the preferred priority mode is rapid transit, mass transit, call it what you like, I'm just interested in getting as many people and freight across this gap as possible. If the analysis um, informed by that evidence arrives at, let's say light rail, um, mass transit as the the first mode to go ahead and it doesn't have to you know, um, wait for the big mega project of bridge for freight, et cetera, will that, um, Will that rise to the top? Will that be very clearly articulated, um, you know, if it's backed by the evidence? That's that's the first question. The second question is a local yes. interest question. Yes. And, I'll just let and ask that first question, please, and then we'll go to your second one. Okay, good. Yeah, Councillor Darby, I can probably answer that question. Um, so uh, there's no doubting we are looking at, and I think Duncan's already alluded to the, the importance of staging and when we can do things. Um, so uh, in answer to that question, yes, uh, as long as it, it you know, we're, we're going to put these options out um, or scenarios out to be discussed in a public forum um, and, and the feedback that we get from that and also the decision makers um, uh, will um, help shape that um, position that you are, um, uh, are raising as to uh, when we can deliver what um, mode in what order. But Auckland Light Rail integration is fundamental and we're working very closely with the team. Okay, and just very quickly, Chair, and it's a local one, and uh, Councillor Hills did allude to this as well. Is there going to be an, an examination of, um, say, the possible Auckland Night Rail route, not just running up the busway, but being specifically smiles into the Glenfield area, running through to North Harbour? Both those areas are very remote from, you know, good connections and then running through to Albany. So I'm talking about some look, very keen looking at a more Western journey to towards Albany rather than a straight line journey. Just want some assurance on that, please. Yes, yeah, so, we, so we are looking at, at uh, other areas of the city. Uh, what we have to be aware of is that we, some aspects of the study are, are slightly longer term in terms of being able to understand uh, and be ready to actually articulate the, you know, all of the differences between the various alignments on the North Shore, for instance. Um, so we may we may focus on um, the, the crossing options ahead of the northern options, but we will be asking questions around the northern options. Um, what we want to make sure is that we actually do understand the information the public need, and we have actually got really good quality information that the public will need to actually give us valuable feedback, particularly for the northern area. Um, and because it is actually the, it's the less developed part of the study, because there's a lot of work done on the crossing itself, um, and there are other, other variables associated with a rapid transit network on, on the North Shore or a, a, a mass transit network. Um, that we want to, as I say, we want to make sure that we understand those variables before we actually ask the public of their opinion. So we will consult on some of that, but it, it may not be as detailed as the crossing option. Okay, so thank you. Thanks for the questions. Final question on this matter, Mayor Brown. Thank you. Uh, item 12 today is about an Auckland integrated transport plan, which will inform um, the debate about light rail and the harbour crossing, amongst other things. Um, once, uh, and the, the wider matter harbour connections was a politically initiated project rather than a demand initiated project. And it's very hard from when you're inside those things to actually have a business case which says maybe we don't need to do this or something completely different might occur. We don't have any growth going on in Auckland at the moment. The light rail is a long way short of being a real thing here. So you're going to um, commence consultation before we've got a, a, an integrated transport plan out 
And I mean, if concentration, if consultation is going and asking everyone in North Shore if they want another bridge, they're going to want another bridge. But in fact, I think it would be good if you could consider actually just slowing down until we have seen what comes out of the integrated transport plan. Not just all modes, but all things. Thank you. OK, yeah, thank you. A bit of uh, f feedback there also. OK, so uh, that brings us to the end of the item. I thank our presenters from the, uh, the project team today. Again, another uh, very informative um, presentation and one which we will have to give some thought to as to, as to how we respond and re respond in a reasonably timely manner. Um, I'll ask uh, Councillor Hills and Derby to, to move in uh, second the motion to receive the update uh, on the Wairamata Harbour Crossing project. Um, thank you uh, to those two councillors. Um, I don't think we've got any debate or any need for any debate. Um, so that being the case, I'll just uh, put, put the motion to uh, receive the update. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Th thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we will try, uh, councillors and mayor, to get through uh, part of item 10. Um, at, at this stage, I, I really must apologise for the sort of uh, constant uh, attempt to hurry people up. We, we've actually got way, way more on our program today than, than, we're, than we should have, but that's really beyond our control. So I'm certainly appreciating the cooperation of councillors in trying to you know, expedite matters. And to that extent, we will break up our presentation on the um, interim update on Auckland floods and infrastructure impacts. We've got Craig McElroy, uh, General Manager of Healthy Waters, and Andrew Chin, uh, the Executive Director of Special Project from Watercare, who um, are going to present uh, to start off with, and then we probably will pick up the other presenters after lunch. I think that's the way it goes. I just would make the point at the start that, that this is, as, as we all know, we, you know this is <laughs> we're still in the recovery of the, of the first two floods, so this is really just a, a, a kind of a stock take of, of, of what's happened and what the initial response has been. Obviously, our committee is going to have to pick up these matters uh, uh, in light of the flood events uh, as a part of our work program, and that will be m monthly updates. So th there will be plenty of opportunity to examine more of the specifics of what has occurred in our response as, as the year progresses. So thank you. Without any further ado, I hand over to you, Craig. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I'll keep this as brief as possible to allow plenty of time for questions. So three things we want to cover off uh, this afternoon. The hydrology of the storm event itself, our operational response to date, and the impact on our stormwater infrastructure. And that's just a shot from Henderson on the 27th of January. We've got here a, um, was it hopefully going to be a simulation of the rain radar event? Can someone just click on that? Um, and that, that's effectively the rain radar. And you see up the top, that's midday at the moment, coming through to one o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, through to 10, 11, midnight. Now, what's exceptional about the event is that the intensity of the rainfall was very widespread across the region. Very unusual to have an event of that duration over that um, uh, a degree of geographic um, inclusion. What was also interesting about the 27th of January is that the forecasters didn't get this one quite right. So these are two uh, forecasts, one from Windy, one from Metview. The blue line is the predicted rainfall and the yellow is the actual. And the two spikes are the 27th of January and the 1st of February. So unlike Cyclone Gabriel, where the forecasting was incredibly accurate, in this case, 
the forecasting wasn't accurate, but what I can say is that even on that small blue intensity, the preparedness was on a normal, um, considered to be a normal heavy rainfall event where there's a whole lot of preparedness work that takes place. So the preparedness work still happened for this event, not knowing what exactly we were walking ourselves into. So from the rain radar, this is the actual, um, the annual um, rainfall intensity. So the black indicates greater than a 100-year event. And inside that black area, the greater than 100-year event actually is across all durations, whether it's for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, six hour, 12 hours, 24 hours. Just about in all cases within that black area, we exceeded that event. In fact, uh, you'll see there that this is actually the wettest 24 hours in the history of Auckland. And the weather records of Auckland go back uh, to the early 1900s. And not only was it greater, it was greater by some 50% than what was previously considered to be a 100-year uh, rainfall event. This is uh, Cyclone Gabriel. And um, for Cyclone Gabriel, um, very similar um, uh, around the 100-year intensity. But, of course, what's happening in Cycl Cyclone Gabriel, if you compare to the previous slide, is it's almost the, the rest of Auckland that missed out on the first event ironically got hit with the second event. And in terms of Cyclone, cyclone Gabriel, um, we had in Piha in a 24-hour period, 360 millimetres of rainfall. Okay. 360 millimetres of rainfall in Piha in a 24-hour period, which absolutely made all of our previous estimates um, redundant, to be quite honest, because it was so far in excess of any previous design prediction. We had gauges in Murawai that got that. Just moving on to our operational response. Um, this information is a little bit out of date because since the slide back was prepared, a lot has happened. So I think we're currently running at about um, 3,500 requests for service. Now, to put that into context, in a typical year, we'll probably see something in the order of 6,000 requests for service. So in about a three-week period, we've got about 60% of our annual total uh, occurring at the moment. And that, of course, is putting huge demands on the staff who are out there um, responding to these issues. The good news is that we've actually got out there and just about been able to look at every request for service that has come in. Some can be resolved immediately, but a number require a much more detailed engineering investigation. So as of the moment, we have some 970 engineering investigations that are ongoing. So the sheer scale of the event means that we've had to do a lot of immediate upsizing, if you like, within Healthy Waters from the wider uh, stormwater community to assist in this area. So when we look at our own staff and consultants and contractors who are currently engaged in our response, that number is over 300 full-time equivalents and increasing as I speak. just like to highlight the fact that we do do a lot of work on um, hotspot inspections for every um, event where there is bad weather forecast. So we have some 230 assets or locations that are subject to that work. And this is an example at Sunny Nook, which is one of our recent stormwater projects where we've created a big embayment area to deal with big uh, events. And so this is the cameras that are actually on the uh, Sunny Nook grill. So you can see what it was like uh, when the event started. And on the right-hand side, you can see where it got to at the peak of the event. But you can see how quickly on the day after, on the 28th of January, the water levels have reduced. But you can also see the good work that the grill did 
because just look at the sheer volume of material that's deposited against the grill. And, of course, that all happened through the event. We've got no way of knowing it, how that occurred, because it's all hidden by the water. But that's the after effect of that grill. And so um, I know at the time the community was surprised how large that grill was, but it's certainly done its job. And you can see there that the area's now, you know, pretty much a day or two after the event, that area's back to normal. So that's what can be achieved with good proactive stormwater design. Just like to briefly mention the issue around the, um, the AT assets and the catch pits. So there's 115,000 catch pits in Auckland Transport, which Healthy Waters undertakes annual maintenance on those catch pits. The catch pits and the table drains in the rural areas are dealt with directly by Auckland Transport, with the one exception of the western half of Waiheke Island, which Healthy Waters also does. So that's just showing you when a catch pit clearing occurs. It's quite an intrusive operation. We've got to have um, appropriate um, safety measures in place. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about for both catch pit cleaning and street sweeping is that, because one of the issues we've got at the moment, you go to do um, sweeping or clearing in a, in a street and cars are in the way. You can't get to the catch pit because there are cars parked over the catch pits. So one of the future initiatives we want to think about is maybe having a bit like a rubbish bin collection uh, slot where every so many months a street is dedicated for a full uh, clearance where the sweeping and the catch pit clearing is done and we have, the residents would have to find alternative parking arrangements. That's the sort of thing that we probably need to do. In Japan they have forklift trucks that come along and lift up all the cars out of the way to do the cesspit clearing just to show you that it's such a big issue internationally. So look, moving forward, we really think that the, um, the catch pit frequency annual cleaning is not good enough and we need to look at the ability for more funding to increase the frequency of that cleaning. Next point I'd like to make is around um, infrastructure and the fact that when we talk about of our network, a massive part of our network is both ground soakage and um, natural streams. So if you take ground soakage, it's where we've got the fractured basalt, which provides a, a pathway for the water um, to get into the natural groundwaters. The problem is that those areas do not work. Um, when we get to really high intensity rainfall, those areas get absolutely saturated. So there's nowhere for the water to go. We get ingress into the pipe network, and in this case here in King George Ave Epsom, there's actually been, uh, you can see where the manhole lid is flipped as well. And so that's contributing to, um, which almost certainly that would be a combination of stormwater and wastewater contamination in that particular circumstance. Another example of um, uh, high groundwater is what we occurred in, in a number of our soakage areas. Um, Kingsland, Morningside, around Eaton Park and Onihunga were some of the worst affected areas. And this is a, um, a site in Leslie a Avenue in, in Morningside, just showing the extent of the flooding created by the groundwater levels. So it's actually Brewster Avenue, Morningside is that particular shot. And we observed very similar, I could have repeated this many times, of photos from Eaton Park and from Onihunga. And the water just can't be pumped down because the hydrostatic pressure from the groundwater will push to the surface faster than the pumps can remove it. So there is no pumping solution under this circumstance. You've just got to let Mother Nature take its path. Mentioned before the um, natural streams that we're dealing with, 16,000 kilometres of natural streams. Without those streams fully functioning from a hydraulic point of view, the network can't perform efficiently and a lot of those streams are in private ownership. And so these are just some of the challenges that we've got around stream blockages and the sheer scale of the length of stream and relying so heavily on public information around what's happening in those streams because with the best will in the world, we can't get around 16,000 kilometres of streams. So these are just three examples uh, of some of the work the team have been doing trying to clear blockages from the streams. We've got Sunny Nook on the left, a big blockage at the Newland culvert in the middle and the Whangapuri stream 
uh, Pukekohe in the, uh, on the right hand side. Just, just to clarify that, we've been through the Oh, sorry, this is all. Sorry, I, I guess I thought it was self evident. This is all material that arrived unannounced on the 27th of January through Overland Flowpath. So some of the scenes that we've seen, I can assure you, are quite amazing of portable buildings and the like that have travelled many, many metres to get into our waterways because the waterways are an, a, a natural part of the Overland Flowpath mechanism is how the city operates. The water starts at the top of the hill, ends up in the sea, and gravity basically takes over. So in terms of the impact on our major projects, um, I think taking all things into consideration, we were pretty lucky with what happened. So the Ports of Auckland project, we had some flooding at the inlet shaft and some silt deposits and, and, an, and a tomo and an erosion next to the railway line, which working closely with Kiwi Rail, we were able to get on and, and respond and deal with that issue quite quickly. We have some pretty dramatic activity in Corbin's Reserve. So that's the site flooded from the um, Opanuku stream um, overtopping its banks. Um, the good news there is that the cleanup costs will be covered by our contract works insurance. Councils just had to pay the 75k excess but the balance of the costs are covered by insurance. So I think this site actually got hit twice. Um, I think it got hit on the um, 27th of February event and then it got hit again on the 1st of February event. And we had a little bit of damage occurred as a consequence of our Clinker Place um, project as well, but relatively minor in the overall scheme of things. So I think it's interesting when you look at infrastructure from a healthy waters point of view, the focus is very much around the natural damage as opposed to the damage to the pipe network, which has been relatively minor by comparison with water queue, which we'll hear about in a minute. We have lost a few lines to slips, etc., but not to the same extent as water queue. And we had a previous example of Sunny Nook. Here's just another example of what good design can achieve. So that's our Freeland Reserve project in Mount Roskill. So you can see what it looked like during the evening of the 27th when it's actually doing its job. But within uh, three days on the 31st of January, life in that area had got back to normal. And so that's where if you can get, get in and be proactive and good, do good design, you can get great outcomes. But what that does mean is you need land in order to obey stormwater flows. You do need land, which is OK in greenfield and new brownfield development. But you can imagine existing urban communities. Where do you find the land to provide that level of stormwater protection? It requires some big um, thinking around the future. And without any further ado, I know I've probably gone over my 10 minutes, but it's hard to stick to the timeline when there's so much to share with you. Kia ora, and I'll hand over to Andrew Chin. Kia ora koutou, Andrew Chin, tai um, Thank you very much. So uh, today I'm uh, representing the water care team, and um, firstly we'd just like to um, thank the Auckland Council team and the wider group Auckland Transport, Waka Katahi, for the collaboration and support Auckland Emergency Management because there's been an awful lot of um, difficult emergency works we've got had to get out to and so very much appreciate the collaborative efforts of the wider council group there. Um, key message there, this presentation slide deck was prepared before Cyclone Gabriel hit so I'll be providing some additional bits of information towards the end about the impacts of Gabriel. On, on the network, but prior to Gabriel, we had all of the trunk services up and running. Um, however, there's still a lot of damage in the local networks that we still haven't found and discovered. So this is Scenic Drive, and you can see the, the broken water main there. This is quite a significant piece of damage, and it really goes to show, as Craig alluded to earlier, um, a lot more damage on water care pipelines due to landslips and erosion. Um, this is the Waitakere number two water main. The water main is still in service, but as you can see there, it's very vulnerable. All of the uh, erosion has left it exposed, and so it's sort of the water mains really holding up the road there. 
the other impact of the slips is the siltation in the dams and the water supplies. You can see the Laonai Tupu there, how dark the water is with the sediment. Now, this has created a number of issues, and in particular, um, following Gabrielle, um, it's knocked out some of the water treatment plants. And so I'll talk to those uh, in a bit, but the sedimentation in the dams is, is a major problem. This is a picture of the White Owl pump station in the North Shore. And you can see on the left there what it looked like during the flood, and on the right, the, uh, the contractors there installing the replacement pumps. You can see the high tide mark on the wall on the right-hand picture. But also you can see the uh, servicemen down at the bottom of the wet well and how large those pumps are. Um, these are really significant bits of kit. And to get the replacement pumps in, um, we had to call in a lot of favours and there was pumps diverted from as far away as Christchurch to get up here at short notice to get the wire rail pump station up and running again before um, Cyclone Gabriel. So that just sort of talks to the phasing of our incident response. And I still think, you know, we've, we've got services restored to a large extent. But um, the key message today is the system is still very fragile, and I'll talk to this now in the following slides. So firstly, the Huia water treatment system on the raw water or the untreated supply, that sediment has reduced the capacity of the Huia water treatment plant. We've also lost some key pipelines that supply the treatment plant. So, so effectively, the Huia water treatment plant is down to about 50% of its normal capacity. What does this mean? Um, I'll probably add Cyclone Gabriel heavily impacted the Waitakere water treatment plant. That is currently out of service because the, the sediment is so high in the Waitakere treatment plant. So... We are now providing water to the wider metropolitan area through to the whole, mostly from the southern catchments um, by the Ardmore treatment plant and the Newland pumping station is now a really critical pinch point and that is back feeding the water up through the west. So it normally goes, the water from the Waitakere's is going into the North Shore and providing the west. Right now we're operating the network so it's feeding up from the south through that critical Newland pumping station. Um, one thing to note is uh, the turbidity in the Hanuas. Cyclone Gabrielle actually was so quite heavy rainfall in the Hanuas, but there was a lot of remediation done following the tempest and improvements to the Ardmore treatment plant. And so things are not looking too bad at Ardmore, thanks to the um, restorations that we've done post the Tasman Tempest. In the local supply, so I've just talked about the bulk transmission supply in the wider network, but um, in the local area around Titarangi, South Titarangi, that, that slip on scenic drive, that water mains out from the Naitupu Reservoir provider that supplies water to the South Titarangi and the uh, Konini water supply zones. So now we've reconfigured the network, so it's been back supplied from the Titarangi zone, and now the uh, a new alternative supply coming in from the Pleasant Point pump station is back feeding those zones. So, water so that was just completed yesterday, so the water supply is back to, you know, up and, and full functioning in that area. Um, but what you don't see there is that now the Waitakere water treatment plant is currently out of service. So just a quick update on some of the uh, impacts of Cyclone Gabriel. Murawai water supply, water treatment plant has been red stickered. The slip has severely impacted that and so the communities there are being um, supplied by water tanker, which they'll have to go down to and get containers to fill up the water tanker at Murawai. That's a major and it's unclear about how long it will take to re-establish uh, alternative water supply to the Murai community. Uh, I've mentioned the turbidity issues in the Waitakere water treatment plant, so that's currently offline. In Helensville, also high turbidity levels. At the moment, we are filling up the 
transmission reservoir with water tankers. So there's a fleet of water tankers going round the clock, topping up the reservoir in Helensville. Likewise in Wellsford, we have got turbidity issues and one of the issues in Wellsford was the uh, roads through Dome Valley were, were blocked off so we couldn't get people up there to inspect and maintain. So Wellsford's also um, currently out of service, but we're thinking we can get Wellsford back up a little bit quicker. For those particular communities, we've put the call out for them to conserve their water use as much as possible. Um, but as you can see from the wider water network, we've lost a lot of redundancy. So we're what, at the moment, we've got you know, the production is meeting the amount of demand, but we're keeping a very close eye on it, and we probably look to call, you know, make the call to get Aucklanders to use water wisely, just as a precaution that we don't want a sudden spike in demand um, to, to, to really sort of take a little bit of that safety margin out of the system. Uh, so, and so on the wastewater side of things, there has been a lot of damage to wastewater networks. Um, so the big uh, trunk infrastructure is back up and running. But as I said earlier, there is an awful lot of, um, in the small gullies and the back of people sections, there's a lot of damage that we do not know about at the moment. So um, we encourage uh, the community to notify water care if they see that damage through the water care websites and the chatbot in the call centre, um, that's the best way for us to track and record and monitor the progress of those repairs and damages. But there will be still quite some time before we discover all of the issues in the local network. Um, the good news is the trunk infrastructure is, is up in place. And this is sort of just a, a little bit of an outline of the recovery process that we're working to at the moment. So um, if there's any partai for Craig and I, happy to receive it now. Okay, so, so thank you, Andrew. They, they, they were uh, two outstanding uh, presentations in terms of the, the visuals that are used there So and, and the challenges that we now face. So so thanks very much for that. And also really good to see the, the cooperation between uh, the Council Healthy Waters and, and, and Water Care, Andrew, of course, uh, seconded to water care, so that's really good to see that uh, cooperation on the ground, particularly in uh, emergency events like that. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the plan is to, to have lunch uh, very shortly, as soon as possible. We've got a lot of information there. We will be revisiting large chunks of this uh, for the remainder of the year now in more detail. So if we could just keep the questions, please, to, to just matters of clarification, because um, you know, we've all probably got things we'd like to examine in terms of what we've experienced ourselves, but they will be getting picked up. OK, so we, we have uh, Councillor Newman and Councillor Turner. Councillor Newman. I've got a pile of questions which I will not give to you today, but I do have one. Your ability at this stage to be able to um, remove trees in the, in the road corridor that are compromising the the resilience of your drains as you have identified through clearance to date. How are you going with that? Yeah, so we're continuing to do clearance work within the natural waterways on a priority basis. Um, yeah, we've only got obviously so much resource we can throw at it, but we're doing all we can and that's, that's on an ongoing basis, Councillor Newman. Um, I, I might just follow up um, in particular around the table drains on the Mill Road corridor. Um, AT have graciously sort of uh, allowed us to use emergency provisions for traffic management to get up uh, and, and clear out those critical drains as a matter of urgency. Are you able to provide some advice as to the rule changes you require um, from Auckland Council in order to be able to effectively remove trees that are where the roots are compromising your drain network? That's quite a complex question. It's not so much just in district, it's not so much in the unitary plan rules. We have provisions in this 
to private land in and around um, those blocks. Oh, and the road corridor. I'm, I'm not aware of any um, major um, impediments under the planning rules for us to do maintenance in the road corridor. Um, the issues in space of Mill Road and such a busy road, it's obtaining a corridor access request to undertake that work safety with the adequate levels of traffic management. So that, so the, the issue there is around uh, undertaking that kind of um, work on such a busy road with the right kind of traffic management in place. Okay, so thank you. And we, uh, Councillor Turner, who's who looks like he's up inspecting those dams in the Waitakere as we speak. Way go, Councillor Turner. Thank you. My question is relating to uh, Healthy Water and Auckland Transport's relationship, working relationship, hey, maybe maybe the cost, um, the liability relationship. Um, you know, just to, for context, you know, we, the roads are a, are a labyrinth of networks which interfere with um, overland um, flow paths. Um, they redirect all the water into certain places. Um, I noted when you put your pictures up about cleaning cesspits, it's all the visual thing to clean. Who's responsible for the exit pipes of those cesspits, which usually cross the road to the lower side, and to my observation and that of the publics, are not being cleaned out. Um, where, where does the inter reaction between the departments lie and how can we make that more efficient? Thank you. So the cesspit is an Auckland transport asset as well as what we call the, the catch pit lead, that first pipe from the cesspit to the manhole. From there downstream, they become Auckland Council slash Healthy Waters assets. Healthy Waters works with Auckland Transport cleaning out the sumps of the cesspits. So we have the contract to run the sucker trucks that clean out the sediment in the cesspits. The, cat, the, the grating and the grill, that is cleaned through street sweeping, which is managed by Auckland Transport. So cesspit, cesspit lead, asset renewal and replacement, Auckland Transport downstream of that, healthy waters, Cleaning out the sediment from the sumps, healthy waters, clearing the grate, Auckland Transport. Thank you, and there lies the problem. Okay, th thank you, Councillor Turner. So we've just just going to uh, finish up with a quick question. Hills, and finally, Councillor Lee. Thanks, Chair. Um, Thank you. This has been really helpful, uh, I think particularly for those of us who weren't able to get out and, and ex inspect what was going on for ourselves. Um, some of these pictures are really quite devastating. The query I have is really in regard to um, the issue that, that you raised, Craig, around um, the catch pits, and I might get the lingo wrong here, sorry. Uh, I see that the work that we can do about um, some of those waste streams that are effectively up in there. Um, I saw a, a tyre that someone must have actually lifted the grate up and, and put the tyre into the pit. Um, it, luckily, I, I logged that about two years ago and it got fixed. But, you know, some people have been quite imaginative in some of the things they're putting into these pits. How can we work through the waste avenue um, to impact on that? <coughs> I think you're raising a really critical point around wider community education. We have to work with our communities around the whole way that we live our lives and take personal responsibility. And one of the things that I'm really keen to look at going forward is around all of our waterways is how effectively we create a community ownership model for every waterway in Auckland. So we can start to get that immediate um, connectivity uh, back uh, so that we can work far more closely with our communities in the space. Kia ora. Thanks, Councillor Watson. Just quickly, thank both of you and your organisations and all the teams. Um, just phenomenal work that first week. Frank Tian and Ben Halliwell, others were on the phone to me, weekends, nights, 
all sorts of different times. Uh, I think we had a thousand requests on North Auckland alone in that first week. Um, it, it was horrendous, and they were working under some of the worst conditions I've seen. You know, snapped pipes, sewage everywhere, down cliffs, slips, um, and trying to help people uh, all at the same time. So thank you. Just on um, the more general uh, discussion around, you know, there's a lot of blame or assumption around what can happen. Um, you know, our stormwater systems are built for one in 10 year, um, and obviously one in 100 year would probably be 10 times the price, I guess. But but I've had some discussions with you guys around the wall of water we saw on the shore especially. What would it take to have prevented that sort of – I mean, it was like a tsunami in, coming from the inland going out. Is it, Was there any way or could you foresee how that could have – reduced devastate what would it take i'm just trying to understand from your professional views so in the warrior valley in particular um we wouldn't be able to build a bit pipe big enough to convey that away without um seeing any water on the surface uh the warrior valley already has a concrete line channel which has got no vegetation in it whatsoever so um it's not so much trying to build a uh, flood defence and convey that amount of water away. It's trying to adapt the land use to be resilient to having that kind of water on occasion. So is that in your opinions or is it more about trying to reduce severity rather than telling people we could stop what happened, you know, when you're getting eight times the monthly amount in three hours? It, it, we, we couldn't stop that amount of water or contain it um, in, in constructed assets in an economically feasible way. Thank, okay, thank you. And I, I can back that up from my expertise. My fifth form geography project at Westlake Boys on the Wairau stream would concluded the same. Final question uh, from Councillor Lee. I uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, just to recap on the response to Councillor Turner, the issue of street catch pits is more complicated than it would, would appear uh, a la Super City. Um, in other words, is it right to say that the catch pits are in effect owned by Auckland Transport on behalf of, of the city and also the uh, exit pipe downstream, um, but um, and the rest of downstream, downstream network and upstream um, is the responsibility of healthy waters. Is that correct? That's correct. And I might just elaborate on why that is the case. So when the original super city set up those boundaries, uh, the maintenance of catch pits and the catch pit leads uh, is able to be part funded from, road use, from fuel taxes and road user charges by way of the funding assistance rate. So by clearly demarcating that the catch pit and the catch pit lead are part of the road asset, it allows um, funding assistance from several central government to fund the maintenance and renewal of those assets, and they are technically part of the road structure. So, hence, that, that's part of the rationale why the split. Oh, oh really? Okay. Um, in terms of responsibility um, for cleaning those catch pits, is it the responsibility of the owner of the catch pits, namely Auckland Transport, to ensure those catch pits are regularly cleaned, or is it the responsibility of the council? So Auckland Transport funds healthy waters to clean out the sumps. And so by way of contract, healthy waters is responsible for cleaning out the sumps of the catch pits. OK, because thank you. Yeah. That's very clear. Thank you. Mr McElroy and I have a quite a long email archive back in the day regarding catch pits, but they're back in focus again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just before we adjourn for lunch, Councillor Stewart, do you want to have your, your question now? 
just uh, thank you, um, Craig. You'll remember we've, I'm sure you will remember the question. Um, we've had a lot to, to do with um, some of the streams, private streams out in Howick, yeah, yeah. and Matthew Brockovich, um, who was, who's an, an expert in that field, has actually had a lot of meetings with you. But what I want to just say, um, you do realise that the reason why that we didn't get the flooding in the how it catchment, like our, we didn't have that big concentration of rain, so we don't want you to think that it's not going to happen in how again, because it will. If you remember 2018, the pontoons were taken out, taken out in Half Moon Bay, and probably we were the we were the place that got really trashed. And so it does happen everywhere. It just depends on where the concentration of rain is. Mm -hmm. We didn't get it this time, but I just don't want you to forget that. Howick and out east, we also um, get. You could have been worse. I can categorically assure you, Councillor Stewart, that our planning is looking at all areas of the region and treating them all equitably. We, you're right. This this event could hit anywhere in the future, but what we can say with confidence is the sizing of the events has changed so much. So our standards are going to have to change because. What we said was a 100-year event last year isn't a 100-year event anymore. Kia ora. I just so, want to just also just say healthy waters in my community have been absolutely amazing, so I'm very impressed with what they've been doing. They have got a big challenge okay. ahead of them. All right. Th thank you, uh, Councillor Stewart. Look, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're going to adjourn for lunch now. Thank you, Craig and Andrew, for those presentations and, uh, and uh, explanations and uh, the foreshadowing of the challenges that, that, that lie ahead for us now. So we're going to break just for 25 minutes, if that, that's OK, uh, folks. I don't want to get in trouble with the, the councillor's union, but we, we, uh, we need to catch up a little bit of time. So we will reconvene the meeting just after half past one, uh, where we'll continue this presentation on the storm events. Thank you. Hold on.